Welcome, everyone. I call the March 16th, 2021 Bothell Regular City Council meeting to order. Before we move on to the agenda items, I'd like to acknowledge our remote meeting format. Proclamation 20-28 regarding open public meetings is still in effect. Therefore, this meeting will be held entirely remotely. Public comment will be allowed both in writing or verbally. Sign-up sheets were provided by the city clerk's office via the link in the agenda. The video of this meeting will be streamed live as well as recorded and available for later viewing on the city's YouTube channel. A call-in number was provided on the meeting agenda for the members of the public who wish to call in by phone and listen live to the meeting. If you have called in, we ask that you mute your devices so you do not interfere with the meeting. If a participant fails to meet, mute their device and interrupts the meeting, their connection will be terminated. For our call in, for our phone-in callers during staff presentation, staff will make every effort to specify which materials they are, are referencing so everyone can follow along. At this point, we will take roll call of the council members by position number. Please say here when the city clerk calls your name. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Zorns? Here. Council Member Thompson? Here. Council Member McAuliffe? Here. Council Member McNeil? Here. Mayor Olson? Here. Council Member Doerr? Here. Council Member Agnew? Here. All present. Thank you. Lastly, before we begin, I'd like to reiterate some of our meeting guidelines. Speak clearly and pause frequently. Mute your microphone when not speaking. If you're also streaming the live video feed, please turn the sound off as there is a delay. For our council members, if you would like to speak, please indicate by holding up the yellow card in the lower portion of your screen. This will prevent two people from speaking at the same time. And please remember to mute your microphone when you're not speaking. All right, our first item is meeting agenda approval. Are there any changes to tonight's meeting agenda? Seeing none. Uh, mm -hmm. Public engagement opportunities. All right, we have our diversity, equity, and inclusion community survey. Help inform the next steps for the DEI program. Give input at www.bothawa.gov DEI survey by March 26th. Sign up for future DEI updates at bothawa.gov. Notify me. All right. We have a proclamation. So we have Safe Place Week. Whereas Safe Place is a program that quickly connects runaway and homeless youths ages 12 to 17 to services, either by reuniting them with their family or providing them with emergency shelter with nearly 140 programs nationally, including King County. And whereas more than 379,000 youths have been helped at a safe place location or received counseling as a result of safe place information received at school. And whereas since the program's inception in 1983, more than 15 million youth have been educated through the National Safe Place Network's outreach efforts, familiarizing them with the safe place sign and providing them with information about how to seek help. And whereas Safe Place maintains a 24 hour hotline, 1-800-422-TEEN, where youth can directly connect with Safe Place staff and within one hour meet with a Safe Place coordinator who works with the youth to place them at a shelter or reunite, reunite them with their family. Whereas Metro buses, local businesses, and nonprofit organization are among the over 2,100 places in King County that have volunteered to serve as locations where youth can request assistance and staff members are trained to respond and immediately contact Safe Place. And whereas friends of youth and youth care have run in partnership since 2012 to provide Safe Place services for youth in crisis across King County. And whereas the success of Safe Place is based on public and private collaborations and increased awareness will encourage more communities to establish Safe Place locations where youth can readily access the help they need. Now, therefore, I, Liam Olson, Mayor of Bothell, do hereby declare the week of March 21st through the 27th, 2021 as Safe Place Week in the city of Bothell. So 
City Clerk. Uh, it looks like, um, I can't see that Brian Thompson is in, but I do see that there's a phone number that just popped in. Um, and so we do have a caller, which might be him. Um, if that is you, Brian, could you use the raise hand feature and we'll panel you into the meeting so you can accept the proclamation. I don't, I don't think Mr. Thompson's here to accept the proclamation, but we'll make sure we mail it out to him. All right. Thank you. All right. Looks like our next, next item is the Snohomish Health District update. It was just a second. We'll panel Mr. Strawn in from the Snohomish Health District. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, council members. Um, thanks for having me this evening. I'd like to take just a uh, few minutes to go over some uh, current activities that the health district's involved with and then uh, be available to answer any questions that, that you may have. And I'm going to share my screen, if I may. All right, is that working? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, so as I was introduced, I'm Bruce Strawn with the Snohomish Health District. Get that off of there. I'm the um, Assistant Director of our Environmental Health Division, um, one of our two operational divisions of the Health District. The other would be Prevention Services. Um, briefly, we'll talk about a few non-COVID things because we had a few non-COVID things going on. Um, a lot of our world stopped, but not everything <clears throat> for the last, I guess it's been a year now. Um, we've been working on a number of uh, fairly large projects uh, here at the Health District. We provide a lot of our services online. We've been looking to expand that. Um, I find it odd that I'm old enough to talk about an aging IT infrastructure, but that's where we're at. We've um, got some issues that um, we're dealing with with that and, and working on. Um, we didn't get as far as we wanted. Um, the building we are in um, here on Rucker Avenue and Everett that the health district owns is only about one third occupied by health district staff. And, and we have one tenant, the IRS. Um, we're going through a process now with an architect firm to determine how to best use our space, which should ultimately lead to a fairly massive remodel project, um, and then hopefully leasing of uh, space that we're not utilizing to, to tenants. And then we've got some um, internal projects to increase our transparency, the amount of data that we make readily available to the public. Uh, a lot of that we do via our existing websites and that, and we're also entering, entering into an agreement with um, ClearGov to have a, a website presence dedicated to that. Our environmental health division, this is um, hopefully what 2021 will look like. 2020 was not so much. We conduct annually about 4,500 inspections of restaurants and other food establishments in the county. We respond to about a thousand complaints of different sorts. Um, we permit public pools, which is really any pool or spa that's not in a, at a single family residence or a duplex. So hotels, um, health clubs, apartment buildings, condominiums, uh, YMCA's, sort of folks like that. And then we inspect um, schools and the kitchens associated with them. And our prevention services division, um, this is uh, re last year what went on, sexually transmitted diseases didn't take a break with COVID. We had 3,000 cases reported. Um, our work with child cares was three times more than normal. That, that increase is directly related to assisting folks with um, technical advice. 
um, a thousand other communicable disease cases separate from COVID-19 and in our um, vaccine for children compliance visits were ongoing. This, these statistics are Bothell area is how I would word it. We don't have the GPS, I, GIS capability with a lot of our data to um, specify it to if it's in city limits or not. So I'm not personally aware of how well your zip codes line up with your city limits. But so this, all of these, this data is from um, Snohomish County side of Bothell um, in zip codes that are assigned to Bothell. So 257 food establishment permits, associated complaints. Um, to date, 205 COVID cases involving businesses with Bothell addresses. And then at our community-based testing sites, we've had um, almost 4,000 folks with Bothell addresses come in to, to be tested. Our website has a lot of information on um, our coronavirus response. Um, we try to keep it current with all the current guidance from the State Department of Health and the governor's office, as well as a lot of statistical data. Um, this is a heat map of the cumulative COVID cases through February, February 20th. It says, um, I haven't seen a map comparing this with our population density in the county, but I suspect it lines up really well. So um, it's kind of how you would expect those areas of the county that have the densest population um, have the highest number of cases. And then um, I sent an email to try to get clarification on this slide. <clears throat> I think it's missing a word. It says rate by zip code for two week period. I believe it's a cumulative rate per zip code um, because it indicates that some of these are 400 to 500 plus per 100,000 cases. And our our current case rate is nowhere near that. It's It peaked at about, for the county as a whole, around 480 cases per 100,000 um, in the early part of January. It's been coming down ever since then. Um, I saw a new number, it was either yesterday or today, we're down to like 78 or 79 cases per 100,000. <clears throat> um, where we're currently working and where our emphasis is gonna be um, in the near future is we continue to work with hospitals, long-term care facilities on a case investigation and and that sort of thing. Uh, disease prevention, we're, we're still doing case and contact investigations that will likely continue as long as we have COVID cases in the community um, and outbreak investigations. Outbreaks are generally described as when you have two or more uh, identified cases with a common commonality assigned with them, whether it be a location they someone was at at the same time. Most often now it's, uh, we're talking about schools or employers. We're doing a lot of work answering school uh, questions for schools. Um, I know you hear schools in, in the news a lot lately. The guidance from the state is changing um, on an almost daily basis. <clears throat> it's difficult for schools to keep up on that. So we kind of are a resource for them to uh, get the latest work. The um, health district together with the County Department of Emergency Management has formed a vaccine task force. Uh, the primary role of that task force is operation of, I believe now it's five uh, mass vaccination um, clinics. Several of them are drive up, two of them at uh, one at Boeing, out by Boeing, and the other one at the uh, Angel of the Winds Arena are walk up. Uh, where vaccines are being administered. Um, we work with the county on a lot of our demographic data. Um, and then prioritization um, work to make sure those who should be, can be vaccinized, vaccinated are. Um, here's some data on vaccines. And unfortunately, 
you know, this, this changes daily. And this is from February 27th. So there's a few anomalies in here um, that have kind of changed a little bit. This top part is um, doses actually received in the county. And then for this one week, the number of doses that were allocated are going to be sent to us. And so then, and then the totals are down here. Um, so the total doses as of February 27th was 230,000 for the county. Down here is administered. Um, so you'll see Johnson & Johnson, the one-shot vaccine, we received 5,000 doses this week. We have not received anything since then. And we're not really sure why that is. It kind of, it surprised us when we got it. We got a notification on a Wednesday that we were going to receive it. We got 5,000 doses and um, no more has been allocated through DOH at the state since then. I, I think Johnson & Johnson vaccine is coming into the state, but it's being diverted to pharmacy groups and other clinical groups that are working directly um, with pop-up clinics, targeting schools and that sort of thing. So this vaccine came in and down here, it shows zero vaccines administered when in reality, now the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is um, almost depleted. There's also a big discrepancy here. Uh, doses received in the county, 230,000 and 160,000 administered. This was right around the time that the big uh, snowstorms and blizzards were happening back east. And we went about two full weeks without receiving any vaccine in the county because of that. And then it all came at once. So for about another week to 10 days after that, there was kind of a glut of vaccine amongst those providers who did have it until they were able to push it out. Um, these numbers are much more in line now. Um, moving forward, so in, I believe it was December of 2019, our Board of Health adopted a strategic plan for the health district to guide us in our next five years. And then COVID happened and we promptly set the thing down and haven't hardly looked at it since. So we're a bit behind in a lot of our um, strategic, in our initiatives and our strategic plan. Um, this was some of the goals within that. A big change for citizens in the county is this one on vital records. On um, January 1st of this year, our state became what's called a closed state for vital records. Uh, it used to be if you had somebody's birth date and legal name, you could buy a copy of their birth certificate. Now you have to prove a relationship status with the person in order to get a birth or death certificate for that person. So it's about protecting people's privacy, um, but it creates a lot more work and unfortunately expense for the public in getting these records. It's a lot more time consuming than, than it used to be, but it, it is a change. Um, made it very difficult having our office closed to implement these changes because you know a lot of folks just don't work on the internet and I do it a good part of my day and so it's second nature but a lot of folks don't and so it really created some problems for people getting these records that they really need um we are we do have our office open again now it's by appointment um so we're able to take care of a lot of those a lot of that business i have a couple of slides uh here on the health district revenues this is a real obvious uh effect of covid our 2019 budget to 2020 amended, jumped up $12 million on a $16 million budget. Um, almost all of that was CARES Act money, directly related to providing testing services, contact tracing, a little bit on vaccines, but not a lot because that happened at the end of the year. It paid for some planning for vaccine activities. Um, the health district since uh, COVID hit has more than doubled our FTE count. We went from about 115, 120 to about 240 staff right now. And then this is our budget that was adopted was in this range. Um, as it's looking now, this is going to once again blew up, balloon up probably similar to the 2020 budget or bigger. 
this was our revenue forecast. Most of the work was done before COVID hit. It reflects the uh, 2020 amended budget, but it doesn't have any of our changes yet for, for 2021. And like I said, I suspect that our total budget's gonna be up here in the 26, 27 million range, maybe higher. Um, we work with um, our partners at the state legislature and the federal government, always uh, trying to stay in their sight as they're working on these things to ensure continued funding. Um, we do have a little bit of an issue looking out. Thankfully, it's probably six or seven years from now where the trend is that our um, revenues won't keep up with our expenditures in the long run. Um, and that's part of what the Rucker Building remodel is, is meant to address if we can bring in some rental income from that, which would help stabilize things. And then also a uh, public health foundation has been created in Snohomish County, Sound Foundation for Public Health. And um, it's just now beginning to get organized. They have a board. I believe the paperwork that this references has been filed. So it's a, a legal nonprofit um now and so we're working on an mou between the foundation and the district to establish what the relationship for the two is and the long-term goal is for this board to <clears throat> search out and provide uh, grants and contracts and that sort of thing for um to help provide increased public health funding um hopefully to the health district but it's not a health district organization so they'll be free to direct those funds to um, any any agency or other group in the uh, count, county that's providing public health services. Uh, our no website here again with some uh, of our social media sites that we're on and, and our website for more information. And contact information for myself and Sean Frederick, who's our administrator and <clears throat> can't do all of these presentations. He needs a break now and then, so. You got me. And that's that's the presentation. If uh, you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to either answer them or write down the question and get back to you with an answer if I have to do that. Well, thank you, Bruce. It looks like we have a question in first from Deputy Mayor Zorns. Uh, real fast, on uh, the uh, vital, what do we call it? The vital records. What happens if it's a brand new parent that wants to get a uh, birth certificate for their child. Do they have to be there in person and prove that they're related to that infant? You know? Um, you have to, you don't have to be in person. You, you have to either come in in person or mail in copies of documents which would demonstrate that. Oh, perfect. Okay, yeah. good. And then the other thing is uh, the Sound Foundation for Public Health sounds like a great assist. Are they going to also include um, mental health services? Nonprofit, you know, helping with mental health? And I, would I don't know the complete uh, scope of that. Okay. I can look All right. at that. Well, I'll keep an eye out for them. Sounds like a great assist for, for, um, for you guys. And that's it. Those are the only questions I have. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Agnew. Uh, have you guys been having an issue with people getting their initial vaccine and then not showing up two weeks later to get their final vaccines? It's really hard to track that because you don't have to go back to the same place to get your second shot. You you need to receive, if it's the Pfizer or the Moderna, you have to receive the same type of vaccine, but it doesn't have to be from the same provider. So it's really difficult to track that. I, I know on a countywide basis, we're not having problems the state when they ship the vaccine they actually differentiate between doses if it's if it's intended to be for persons receiving their first shot or their second one and so we're having to actually in the drive-up clinics advertise them as such 
you know, these days are for people looking for an initial shot. These are for, for um, second doses. And they have to keep the vaccine counts separated by that. And there hasn't been an issue pushing the second doses out. But what percentage of folks are not following through, I, d I don't know. That data will become clear probably as we get further down the road and they're able to look at it, you know, do exports out of these, um, it's called the state vaccine registry to, they'll be able to determine how many got one, but not the second, that sort of thing. Okay, thank you. I just, and I, I'd like to commend you on, on, Snohomish County had the first COVID case in the United States. You guys have done a commendable job, all things considering. So my hats are off, my hats off to you guys. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Bruce. Great presentation. Thank you very much. All right. Up next, we have a staff brief staff briefing on the conservation district services in Bothell. And I believe Christy Cox will be presenting our surface water program. Getting myself all set up here, just one moment. Okay. Mayor, can you confirm that you can see my screen? Can, yes. Good. All right, thank you so much. Good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, and Council members. Um, my name is Christy Cox, and I'm one of the City of Bothell's Surface Water Program Coordinators. I know you have a very full agenda tonight, so I do really thank you for the opportunity to share information about conservation district services that are available to Bothell residents. Conservation districts benefit communities by providing free technical assistance to land managers. They work with rural and urban residents to provide guidance about stormwater treatment methods like rain gardens, bioswales, and detention ponds, as well as assistance with habitat restoration, invasive species removal, planting, riparian buffers, natural yard care, forestry planning, agriculture, living with wildlife, septic system care, youth education, and a whole lot more. Washington has 45 conservation districts, which are typically designated by county. Because Bothell is split between, between two counties, we have two conservation districts to serve our residents, King and Snohomish Conservation Districts, which I will refer to as KCD and SCD for the rest of this briefing because it's a little easier to say and shorter. You may hear me talk more about SCD than KCD, and that is because the two conservation districts have an agreement that allows SCD to provide services within King County whenever KCD doesn't have the capacity to do so. Successful conservation districts, I'm sorry, successful conservation efforts largely depend on private landowner participation. City staff work with the conservation districts, often in a behind the scenes role to make sure that all city codes and standards are followed. Because conservation districts are non-regulatory agencies, we found that many residents are much more at ease receiving guidance from an expert who isn't necessarily also an authority. So now I'm going to jump into some of the services and conservation district, the conservation districts have provided to Bothell in the past several years, as well as what's coming up. You'll see a lot of images in the following slides and that's to give you a good visual idea about the positive impact that conservation districts have on our community. So I'm gonna start by talking about rain gardens. Rain gardens are meant to capture rainwater from roofs or other hard surfaces and direct that water into a rain garden instead of into the storm drains. Our conservation districts have worked together on several rain garden projects throughout the city. A few years ago, they found four willing homeowners near Bothell High School to install rain gardens. SCD has a veteran crew, as you can see here, who completed the digging and preparation work for these residential rain gardens. After the prep work was finished, 
Both conservation both conservation districts work together to hold a community rain garden planting party where volunteers added plants to each of the four new rain gardens in those homes. Here you can see one of the rain gardens being prepared at the planting party in 2018. And then the photo on the right is the same rain garden just a few weeks ago. One of the volunteers that attended the planting party also happened to be a developer. So he reached out to the districts to help him with a planting plan for three rain gardens he was installing in the Moon family apartments. You can see the before and after here, and it looks like his rain gardens are doing really well. Last summer, the districts installed a rain garden and parking lot retrofits at the North Shore Senior Center. I apologize that I don't have a more appealing photo. It usually takes a few years for the rain garden plants to really get established and look a little more aesthetically pleasing. Our conservation districts also provide technical assistance for private stormwater system maintenance. They have experience working with HOAs to help answer their questions about things like rain gardens, bioswales, detention ponds, and drainage issues. You're looking at some photos of the Verde development when it was initially built. Our conservation districts have been instrumental in helping the residents understand how to keep these gardenings functioning as designed, how to keep these gardens functioning as designed, and they provided planting plans to help the residents know what and where to plant when an area needs to be filled in. Another very important service that STD offers is youth education within Bothell's schools. SCD provides elementary and secondary environmental science lessons to public and private schools within Snohomish County. The curriculum meets state standards and the lessons integrate local natural resource issues so that students can become more aware of the conservation issues happening in their own communities. For those schools that are not within Snohomish County or who choose to use a different program, the city also partners with Nature Vision, a local nonprofit organization to provide stormwater and water conservation programs to students in grades K through 12 in all of Bothell schools, regardless of which county they live in. Both SCD and Nature Vision have successfully adapted their programs to fit within the COVID-19 learning environment, offering a variety of learning platforms and hybrid models. The picture on the left shows some third grade students at Shelton View Elementary learning about wetland filters. And the photo on the right shows one of Nature Vision's educators recording a video for the Salmon Cycle Remote Learning Program. Another, I just went past my next sheet. Hold on, sorry. Another service that SCD offers is a green schoolyards program where they work with a local school, in this case, Crystal Springs Elementary, to convert an existing space to serve a more beneficial purpose. At Crystal Springs, SCD installed three cisterns to capture the rainwater that ran off the roof of one of their portables, and then they were able to use that water on an edible garden that was behind the portables. SCD also helped them convert their courtyard area to be a native plant habitat, and the teachers and students decorated its pathway with rocks that they painted representing who they are. To get students even more involved, the higher grade level students gave presentations and answered questions for all of the younger classes about how, cist how cisterns function, their purpose, and why saving water and preventing stormwater pollution matter. Both districts offer a number of stewardship workshops each year, including topics like septic system care, living with wildlife, beautifying your streamside property, and natural yard care, to name a few. Many of these workshops used to be held in person, but were offered online during COVID-19. You're looking at a screenshot from last year's Living with Beavers workshop and this year's Best Horsekeeping Practices workshop. 
One of my favorite in-person workshops that we've done with SCD was a do-it-yourself rain barrel workshop at the Bothell Operations Center a few years ago. SCD staff taught residents how to build their own 55-gallon rain barrel for $35 that they could then take home and they taught the participants how to set up, use, and get the most out of their rain barrels. We're hoping to be able to offer another workshop in 2022. Both conservation districts have their own volunteer programs, but whenever an opportunity comes around, we like to partner with them to host events here in Bothell. A number of years ago, the city worked with KCD to improve habitat along the banks of Park Creek in the Bothell Business Park, as you'll see here. This effort has required maintenance and some replanting throughout the years, so we've held several volunteer events with KCD to complete some of those tasks. One of these events, Orca Recovery Day, is held each October and is celebrated by conservation districts throughout Puget Sound. It's been a great way for local volunteers to lend a hand. As you can see in this picture, this is a group of friends and family who came out to Park Creek to spread mulch and add about 300 native plants on a dreary day in October to celebrate a friend's birthday. Now let's talk plants. Both conservation districts offer annual plant sales for native plants. Before COVID-19, they offered walk-up sales, as you can see in this photo of KCD's 2019 sale. In 2020, and again this year, both districts were able to modify their plant sales to comply with COVID-19 safety guidelines, essentially offering a drive-through for folks to pick up plants that they had pre-ordered. These native plant sales are popular because a lot of native plants can be kind of difficult to find in our local nurseries. And at the annual sales, most of the plants are sold as bare root, which means they are not planted in pots. They don't have any soil with them. So you can purchase them in bundles for a pretty low price. Both districts offer resources and videos about how to properly store these plants until they're ready to be planted and then also how to correctly plant them to help them grow successfully. The last program I'm going to talk about is one I'm really excited to be able to offer this year, and that is SCD's Lawns to Lettuce program. This program encourages landowners to convert a portion of their lawn to grow edible plants in a way that builds healthy soil, protects pollinators, minimizes pesticide use, reduces runoff, and conserves water. And if your garden space, if you have space in your garden to grow more vegetables than you need, you can consider donating them to a food bank through the Plant a Row campaign. The picture that you're looking at is from a project just outside of city limits that STD helped with a few years back. This is called the 13th Place Garden, and it was a collaborative effort between some neighbors that found themselves with a vacant lot and wanted to do something useful with it. Our current scope of work with SCD this year calls for the Lawns to Lettuce program to be implemented in a number of yards for individual homeowners, but we would really like to put out a call to the community to see if there's a private landowner or organization that has the space and willingness to host a larger community garden, much like a peat patch garden you've probably seen somewhere before. Bothell United Methodist Church graciously provided space to host several community gardens for about a decade, as shown in this picture taken a few weeks ago, but that portion of land has since been sold, so we're hoping to find a new location and some community members willing to volunteer as managers for a new garden. So council, if you or the community knows of any prospects that could help make a larger community garden a reality, please do let me know. I've got my email address big and bold down there. Now that we have reached the end of the slides, I would like to thank you again for giving me the opportunity to share all the wonderful things that our conservation districts are doing in our community. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have.
Council Member McAuliffe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, great presentation, Christy. I loved it. Oh, one of my, one of my biggest uh, things I've ever done over my career is um, uh, a program called uh, Leave No Child Inside. And so it was like to get children outside to learn through nature and through gardens and through everything we could do. So loved your presentation. Um, on the community garden though, let me ask you, um, what do you contribute? So somebody gives you, say a piece of land. So what do you as a conservation district do to contribute? As I understand it, and I would need to get a few more details from SDD to be able to answer totally accurately, but they would come in, they would help educate people about how to run the program, how to build the raised beds, what different kinds of growing containers you can use. Um, there is a Lawns to Lettuce Facebook group right now, and they also send out a monthly blog that tells you what's ready to harvest, what's in season right now, what food banks are in need. So the conservation district really helps get everything established and provides you with ongoing information that the community members who are running the garden would need to be able to keep it going successfully. So, so what you're telling me is that they give the guidance and the education, but it has the community plant and, and, and take care of the garden. Is that the conservation district, the conservation district could definitely help with, you know, the initial planting and showing mm -hmm. the proper techniques for tending to the vegetables. Okay. Um, giving everyone, they're really great about giving everyone the information that they're going to need to be successful. And they're always available for follow up and questions whenever we need them. I hope to find you one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Deputy Mayor Zorns. Christy, thank you so, so much. Uh, do, would you happen to know if all of North Shore school dis schools um, are, participate with the conservation district since some are in the Snohomish and some are in King County? So I can't speak for the schools that are, let's see. So the way that, that we work with SCD, they can provide education to any of the schools within Bothell city limits okay. and Snohomish County in general, they can provide that. And then we supplement that with nature vision who has a contract with us to provide services strictly to any school within Bothell, regardless of County. But as far as, you know, if someone was in North shore, but was in unincorporated King County, I'm not sure what the agreements are there. I believe Kirkland also works with Nature Vision, so they probably have similar programs, but I don't, I couldn't tell you with with a surety. Okay, well, I hope the cities of Woodenville and Kenmore are part of this conversation because they have a lot of those schools as well. Um, rain Barrel, sign me up, have to with <laughs> love more, got lots of rain. Um, and there has been so much uh, uh, buzz in the community on social media for pea patches and community gardens so that mm -hmm. however the city can, you know, put out the alert that we're looking for people who have a vacant lot. I mean, I, there are people chomping at the bit for it. So I'm sure you've thought about that, but um, I would be glad to, you know, pass on to my community a link if the city had something to set up. And yeah. Uh, and, and I know of a church that has a pea patch, so I'll, I'll email that to you later. Thank you very much. I was okay. just talking with SCD today and they have, they have several contacts throughout Bothell that they're, that they're also going to reach out to. So I'm hoping we'll find, there, there's we'll find a, it, it could be this, uh, it could be one of those as well, cause they're pretty involved. So, but thank you. Keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you, Christy. Great presentation. Enjoy the rest of your night. <laughs> All right, on to our next item. Uh, we have the legislative update with Assistant City Manager Kelly Mazzoli. Good evening. Give me just one moment and I'll get started here.
Can you see my presentation? Yes, I can. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'm Kelly Mazzoli, your assistant city manager here with the March 16th legislative update. So uh, we are now entering the 10th week of uh, virtual Olympia or legislative session. And we have gone from just over 500 bills now to 415 bills. So what that means is that these bills have been approved um, in the chamber that they originated in, or they are considered necessary to implement the budget. Um, and that also means that now we're taking those bills that are still alive and they're going through the opposite committee or opposite chamber. Um, and now they need to pass out of their respective policy committees on the other side. So that new deadline for us is March 26, 2021. So um, since the last update, there are 11 additional bills that are considered dead um, of those. So we're still supporting, there's four. I'll go over those a little bit later in the presentation, which is down from seven um, from the last report. And we are opposing uh, one, which is down from two last time. So it's the utility liens bill, if you'll recall, I reported on this a couple of times to you. Um, that legislation that we opposed is actually dead for the session. So that's um, good news for us. The one that we are still opposing is the um, uh, removing the authority to bond toll revenues. Um, it still continues to be a concern and it still continues to move forward. So. I'll talk a little bit more about that here um, on my next slide. All in all, we're monitoring um, an additional 27 bills in various different categories, which is down from 34 that I reported last time. So we're narrowing that scope just a little bit. Um, however, there's lots of movement, amendments, different things going on um, and conversations happening. So we're still plenty busy with the, with the few that we have. So currently the city's legislative agenda includes a priority request for $7 million um, in construction funds for the, the Bothell Way Northeast Bothell Everett Highway Winding Project. Um, our lobbyist has indicated, as you know already, that in order to receive funding, the state will, um, the state will need to pass a new transportation revenue package. So also during the session, Council has been made aware of and has also testified in opposition to the bill that I was just talking about uh, that was proposed to remove the bonding authority of toll revenues um, that were specifically identified by the state in 2019 to fund the slated I-405 North End improvements. So facing the realities of the ongoing um, COVID-19 pandemic, the state now estimates a transportation budget shortfall of around $758 million over the next three years, uh, translating into delays of several years on, on the project. So as you're very well aware, these delays are concerning and not funding these projects could negatively impact the Bothell community. Um, significance even increases more so as Bothell becomes a major connecting point or hub for uh, the major uh, transit agencies. So Sound Transit, Community Transit, as well as King County Metro. Um, later tonight on your agenda, you will notice another item uh, where we are asking you to adopt a resolution to urge legislators to uh, approve a transportation revenue package, as well as to um, honor the past commitment on the 405 uh, North End improvements, and uh, hopefully to fund our current request of the 7 million for the Bothell Way uh, widening project. Um, we, uh, we, along with the diligent support of Representative Dewar, thank you very much. Um, we continue advocating for the North Creek Trail Section 4 project. And those are the updates on the priorities. So we uh, do have four bills, like I said before, that we're supporting. And you can see um, those include the tax increment financing is still moving forward. The local government fiscal flexibility is still moving forward, as well as some legislation around public meetings and emergencies. Um, of note is House Bill 1362, sponsored by Representative Dewar, um, lifting the property uh, tax cap, and it's scheduled for a public hearing here on Thursday um, at 8 a.m. And I have confirmed and have a council member who will be uh, there to testify in support um, on this legislation. So. That is my fast and furious update. Um, and I will answer happy, be happy to answer any questions that you may have. And um, also look forward to talking just a little bit more with you about the transportation uh, 
revenue package resolution. Any questions for me? No, you have a packed agenda. Well, thank you once again for a great presentation and keeping us all up to date on everything happening in, in Olympia. Glad to do it. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, next item, we have our council committee reports. Does anyone have a committee report they'd like to speak to? Deputy Mayor Zorns. Uh, real fast, LTAC met today. The sip and stay uh, packets that they uh, have to promote people to come into Bothell and work with the Woodenville Wine District are selling like hotcakes. And um, you'll get more information about that later, but not tonight. Um, the hundred they were expecting a a downturn in revenues from hotel uh, the hotel tax and it, and it, and it did go down, but it was ten thousand uh, dollars more than we that than we had anticipated um, being uh, coming in. So it 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 wasn't as bad as we were expecting it to be. Uh, April 20th, Ralph Thompson and Danae are going to come speak about Street Sense. Mm -hmm. There's no motion that we have to worry about. Um, LTAC members are finding merit, thinking about hybrid meetings next year, and I'm sure you're having those conversations too. So be noodling that around if you care about hybrid meetings when COVID releases its grip, um, what we might be asking to do as a city with that. And that's that's it. All right, thanks. Council Member McNeil. Thank you. Um, I don't know if everybody got the information that I sent on the best starts for kids uh, levy that's uh, upcoming this year. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to mention is there's a couple amendments floating around that um, one is that uh, there's some reporting that's done by zip code uh, where the funding's actually going. Um, and another is uh, there's an amendment um, by um, Councilmember Dombowski, uh, which I am going to co-sponsor, which uh, uh, is trying to get some funding uh, for facilities uh, in one of the areas would be in the north end. So I just wanted to make sure that we had an opportunity to chat through that. I'll bring it up during uh, council conversations again, but I think it's important that, uh, that we find ways to, to bring capital dollars uh, into our area to build facilities that uh, can be spaces for our youth, uh, similar to what we did with our senior centers. Thank you. All right, not seeing any others. City Clerk, do we have visitor comment this evening? Uh, we do, Mayor Olson, thank you. Um, we received three written comments. Um, I'll go through those first. Uh, Susan Gardner wrote regarding AB 29-039, a pop-up retail incubator program, and she provided uh, two uh, alternate proposals. Angelica Riviera, she wrote in regarding hazard pay for grocery workers. Pat Haramoto also wrote in regarding hazard pay for grocery workers. Um, that's all the written. And then I have three people on the line that wish to speak. The first one is B Brian Pickrell. And we give us a minute. We'll get him paneled in so he can get us three minutes. Mr. Pickrell, when you get in, please unmute your mic. Okay, here I am. Can you hear me? Thank you. Yes, you have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, I hope I can get all this in in, in three minutes. Uh, the city council may or may not remember that I asked the, about the Renee Hummel case ban back in October, and I didn't really get an answer to my inquiry. Uh, at the time, I was told that the city can't give out any information by law. Um, uh, I did a little bit of follow-up, and that's not really correct. There's uh, Initiative 940 out there. It requires an independent investigation of a police use of force which in our case, uh, I think you already know it's being done by an agency called SMART, but the law doesn't actually specify that investigations have to be kept secret. Um, and in any case, this, this being a, a kind of a late follow-up, I wasn't asking about the SMART investigation in the first place. 
Uh, there's more to Initiative 940 than doing smart investigations. And the, the law also contains some specific instructions uh, for the, the State Criminal Justice Training Commission. And just reading a couple of excerpts, there's a title in there that says, requiring law enforcement officers to receive violence de-escalation training. And a little further down, tactical methods that use time, distance, cover, and concealment to avoid escalating situations that lead to violence. Now that sort of thing is what I really intended to ask about. Do our officers receive, in the, in the Bothell Police Department, do they receive that sort of training? And if they receive it, do they listen to it? And the, the answer is, I have no idea. I, uh, if you saw the, the video that was uh, released of, of the shooting of Mr. Hummel, that would be the exact opposite of what actually happened. I saw our officer pull his car up right in front of Mr. Hummel and get in his face almost instantly. Uh, no, no time or space allowed. And I don't think he even had time to react before the officers started shooting. Uh, now, what, what I was trying to get at back in October was I would like to know if the Bothell Police Department is doing anything ab about that sort of thing and to change the way that officers approach a 9-11 call. Um, I don't know if that officer was breaking a rule. And, and again, I want to stress this is not to do with the SMART investigation, which is only about whether to charge him with a crime. Was he breaking a police department rule by charging in like that? I, I don't know. Um, I, I would like to find out. And in general, do we have a way for our officers to avoid creating situations uh, that they created and they feel they have to shoot their way out of? Um, following up on initiative 940, uh, it does have that requirement uh, that I partially quoted for the Criminal Justice Training Committee. It doesn't explicitly order the P Bothell Police Department to use that training or the police themselves to listen to what they're trained to do. That you, is up to Mr. us, Mr. the citizens. Sorry, your time is up, Mr. Pickerel. Thank you. Uh, Sorry, next, thank you. Next on the list, we have Michaela Strain. Am, am, am I still talking? talking? We're, we're gonna panel you out, um, Mr. Pickerel. You'll go back in the attendee room. Hi, Michaela. Um, you have uh, three minutes to speak. Okay, well, thank you. Um, good evening. My name is Michaela Strain. I'm a meat wrapper at the downtown Bothell KFC. And I want to speak tonight about the hazard day for grocery workers and compensation for the extraordinary circumstances that essential workers in the city of Bothell are working under. Since the beginning of the pandemic, I and my coworkers have been showing up to work every day to ensure that the community of Bothell had a reliable source of food and goods as many restaurants and schools were shut down. In the beginning, Kroger allowed extra hours and personnel to ensure that, we, that approved cleaning techniques were being followed and to handle the unprecedented amount of increased business that we were doing. Kroger and other grocery chains rewarded us for our hard and hazardous work by giving us a much appreciated $2 an hour bump in pay. That bump in pay was taken away by May, even though the hazardous conditions have remained and at times gotten worse. Our union leaders have been in discussions with Kroger to get that hazard pay reinstated ever since. We find ourselves almost a year later still with no hazard pay. Cleaning and safety techniques are all but have all but faded away. These companies are not some small local business. They are large national corporations that are doing business in our community, making billions in profits and refusing to share that profit with the essential frontline workers that show up every day to help keep this community fed. My hope is that the, the Bothell City Council will consider establishing a hazard pay similar to Seattle, Burien, and King County. Ordinances in those cities have already been written so that it would not be starting from scratch and would save valuable time and energy. Even though things are starting to open up and with vaccines being administered, we are still a long way from normal. The state is still mandating that we wear masks, social distance, and wash hands until we establish herd immunity. That may be, that may be sometime in midsummer. Until that time, we are still working under extraordinary circumstances 
extraordinary circumstances and, and are deserving of hazard pay. I appreciate your time and consideration with this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next on the list, we have Santiago Delgado. Mr. Delgado, you're muted. If you could unmute. Let me see if I can unmute. There you go. Thank you. You have three okay. minutes. Uh Yes, thank you and good evening council. Um, thank you for having me here to support um, <clears throat> to share my support for hazard pay legislation. My name is Santiago Delgado. I've worked at the QFC in Bothell for over a year now. Uh, working through this pandemic hasn't been a walk in the park for grocery workers. On the contrary, it's been one of the most difficult and dangerous things we've been asked to do. I've seen this pandemic tear down my coworkers and cause them tremendous stress and anxiety. Uh, my coworkers and I frequently discuss the dangers we are putting our loved ones in. Luckily, I live alone, but constantly worry for my coworkers and their families. Uh, this disease is far from under control. We see in the news every day that there are new variants spreading locally. Mass mandates and social distancing are still in effect and people are dying. Uh, grocery workers are exposed to these deadly hazards every single day. And we are, we're receiving hazard pay when the pandemic started, which did make us feel like the sacrifice we were making was valued. Uh, but it was shocking and insulting to have it taken away from us while we we're still at risk. Um, the hazards are worse than they were before and we're still asked uh, to social distance and wear a mask. So I just don't understand we're not, why we're not still receiving hazard pay. <clears throat> My store does take precautions to prevent the spread of COVID-19, but it's impossible to prevent it completely. And I do ask the council to strongly consider enacting a hazard pay ordinance. Thank you so much for your time, council members and attendees. Good evening. Thank you very much. That's all I show Mayor Olson on the list to speak under visitor comment this evening. Um, I don't know if anybody else is in the audience that wishes to speak. If there is, could you please use the raise hand function? I'm not showing anybody, Mayor Olson. All right, thank you. Uh, so on to our next item. Uh, we have our consent agenda. Nothing was pulled. Council Member Dewar. I move that we pass the consent agenda. Thank you. Council Member Agnew. I second that. All right. We have a motion by Council Member Dewar with a second by Council Member Agnew. Any discussion? All right. Seeing none, City Clerk. Please say yes or no when I call your name by position order number. Deputy Mayor Zorns? Yes. Councilmember Thompson? Yes. Councilmember McAuliffe? Yes. Councilmember McNeil? Yes. Mayor Olson? Yes. Councilmember Doerr? Yes. Councilmember Agnew? Yes. That's a 7 0. All right. Thank you, everyone. All right. Next, we have our public hearings. We have three of them tonight. So we have AB 21-034, consideration of an ordinance granting a street vacation to Harbor Homes, LLC, for a portion of the northwest corner of Northeast 185th Street and Ross Road. So I will now open this public hearing, and I believe we have Interim Public Works Director Eddie Lowe. Good evening, <clears throat> Mayor and uh, Deputy Mayor and Council Members. I will refer this to staff, uh, Peter Pearson, who is the Development Review Engineer, to walk you through on this uh, proposed uh, street vacation. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, thank you, Mayor Olson and members of City Council. I'm going to attempt to share my screen now, if I could. Can everybody see that okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Peter Pearson and I am a development review engineer in the city of Bothell Public Works Department. 
Tonight I will be presenting information in support of the petition for street vacation for a portion of Northeast 185th Street and Ross Road applied for by the Harbor Homes LLC uh, in connection with their Ross Road Apartments project. Um, so this project proposes to um, construct a, an approximately 100 unit apartment building on Northeast 185th Street between 104th Ave Northeast and Ross Road. Um, just a quick overview on what the street vacation is. Um, basically, uh, it's a process by which the city can transfer land from the public right of way to a private landowner uh, when it is deemed to be in the public's interest. Uh, and that is in contrast to a um, right of way dedication where the private landowner would be dedicating land to the uh, public. So you can see in the in the uh, schematic here, which is a uh, which is it of the project, the yellow shaded area is the um, area that is being proposed to be vacated. And then uh, the green shaded area over here would be the area that's uh, proposed to be dedicated by the um, uh, property owner. So the street vacation requirements are based on um, the uh, RCW chapter 3579 and Bothell Municipal Code chapter 1712. Uh, these um, codes have been followed in this process. Uh, the uh, petitioner submitted a petition and paid the filing fee. They met their two thirds requirement of um, providing signatures from the abutting properties. In this case, they're the property owners of both properties. So uh, that wasn't an issue. Uh, a hearing date was set and uh, subsequently rescheduled in order to clear up some uh, discrepancies between the uh, public notice and the uh, petition. So that's been cleared up. Um, the public notice was sent to nearby properties and city engineering staff, as well as staff from community development and uh, fire have uh, been reviewing the exhibits. So here's a close up of the area of impact. It is approximately 167 square feet of a, a wedge shaped slice of land here that you can see. Um, and basically what it does is it extends the uh, property line parallel to the uh, street center line in Northeast 185th Street. Currently, the property line diverges slightly to the north toward Ross Road. And what this street vacation would do is make that line parallel with the center line of the road. It would also provide the curvature that's required at the intersection corner that we require in our standards uh, for property lines. And, uh, and, and then you can see actually it continues, well, not the vacation, but the proposed right-of-way line would continue north from that point. Uh, and actually this land on Ross Road would be dedicated. So, um, let's see, I'll continue down. Okay, so the purpose of the proposed action is, uh, as I said, to create a continuous property line that's parallel to the road center line, as well as the property line to the west. So it doesn't, it is not a continuation of the property line, but it, but it is parallel to that property line. So you can see the green line here is the proposed new property line, which would do a slight jog to the south here and then, uh, and then cross in front of the vacated area. The red line is the existing property line, which you can see runs parallel to the road center line until about halfway across the block. And then it trends slightly to the north. Um, let's see. So um, 
basically this street layout would allow for all of the improvements that we require for frontage improvements uh, associated with the project. And it also accommodates the future sound transit bus rapid transit line that we'll be using Northeast 185th. Um, so you can see the frontage improvements here are the sidewalk and nine foot sidewalk, which is required in our downtown area. And also a uh, 12 foot lane, 12 foot through lane and an 11 foot right hand turn lane, which Sound Transit has requested in order to keep traffic flowing for buses as they uh, travel westbound on 185th. So this uh, proposal would accommodate that. You can see that in this area at the corner of Ross Road, there is a slight bulb out of the curb. This is a, a, a pedestrian safety slash uh, traffic calming uh, concept here, which uh, is part of Sound Transit's plan. Um, so you can see that there's actually a little bit of excess right of way here that isn't necessarily uh, being used uh, with this design. So the vacated area here, the area proposed to be vacated would not be impacting the uh, required area for improvements. Um, I do wanna make sure that it's clear that this drawing that I'm showing here is actually uh, not a final approved drawing. We're still working with Sound Transit to, and the developer to make sure we get the, uh, the best layout for everybody. Um, but this is this is the most current drawing, and this is getting much closer to what we're going to approve when we when we do finally approve this uh, the construction permits for this project. So um, with that in mind, uh, the developer status for this project currently is that they have obtained their demolition permits and they have actually demolished the five houses on this frontage that's already taken place. They have gotten their site plan review approved. So that was sort of an overall um, uh, land entitlement process to give them the, the option of building this uh, apartment building on those parcels. The street vacation process is uh, obviously currently pending uh, and it is a condition of the site plan review approval that it be approved. The construction permits have been applied for. So that would be the grading permit, the right of way permits and the utility permit. Uh, those have been applied for and those are currently under review uh, pending their second review right now. And then finally, the right of way dedication that the developer will be providing at the uh, completion of the project, which will be recorded with the county once it's once it's complete. So speaking again uh, to the developer improvements. Excuse uh, me. As, as, you, as you saw. Heard, in, excuse me one second, Peter. Um, we've got a gentleman, Mr. Boyce, I believe, Sean Boyce. Um, Mr. Boyce, you're, you're using the chat function. I'm going to ask that you not do that and please um, once we get to the public hearing portion, if you'd like to speak to the issue, we will allow you three minutes to speak. Thank you. Go ahead, Peter. I'm sorry to interrupt. Okay, thank you. Um, so going back to the developer improvements here. Um, this is sort of an aerial view of the uh, land that's being developed. You can see that currently there is no sidewalk along this frontage. So that will be installed by the developer, a uh, nine foot sidewalk. The turn lane will be going in here. Um, there are some improvements, some added parking places on 104th, uh, additional right of way dedication on 104th, as well as on Ross Road uh, and, a, and a new sidewalk on Ross Road. Um, and then 
there will also be some utility upgrades in the right of way here. So the water main, a section of the water main uh, will most likely be replaced and, um, and some other utility improvements. So that's just kind of to explain the project there. Okay, so uh, we did receive some public comments and so I'll try to address some of those. They're not, I don't have them all in the presentation here, but um, because some of them came uh, today, but uh, let's see. So first of all, uh, we had a comment about pedestrian access. So uh, obviously there's, there's no sidewalk on 185th on the north side right now. So that will be um, one of the major benefits of this project. It'll include that sidewalk uh, as well as up into Ross Road. And uh, there is already a sidewalk on 104th, but this will make an improvement to that. So pedestrian access we feel will be improved by the project and not uh, adversely impacted by the, by the street vacation area. Uh, I've got some comments about uh, concerns about increased traffic. We are hoping that this project will help alleviate some of that traffic with the right hand turn lane and the um, uh, rapid transit will facilitate uh, non you know, single, single occupant vehicle traffic, hopefully. Um, and again, pedestrian access will be safer and more available around the project. We had a question about the impact trees. The vacated area would not change the number of uh, trees that are being removed as part of this project, um, to my knowledge. I had a comment, somebody was concerned that we were actually closing Ross Road, I think, and that is not the case. Ross Road will remain open. In fact, it's gonna be widened slightly at the project location here. Um, so Ross Road will remain accessible from 185th Street um, going forward from this project. And I had a question about, uh, will the vacation be impacting the number of units or unit size in the apart in the proposed apartment building and um i will probably let the uh, developers representative speak to that although i think that if it is it's it's a slight it would be maybe a slight increase but i think the main point of this is to essentially square up the property line so that the building setback for the apartment building can be square to the uh, center line of the road and um, constructed without uh, without that slight angle. We also had some questions um, brought up by city council at the um, meeting where we set the hearing date. And one of those had to do with fiscal impacts. So the um, the uh, land was evaluated by Kitter Matthews for the property value as part of the petition application, and they came up with a value of $102.45 per square foot. It's 167 square feet of land, so the uh, total amount that would be compensated to the city is $17,109. When, when we came in with the agenda bill for the set hearing date, um, the understanding at the time was that the code, city code required us to uh, only charge half that amount, but after re-examining the code, we did determine that uh, the full amount should be assessed for the land. So that's what the uh, amount of money would be uh, to compensate for that land. And my understanding is that this would go to the general fund. There was also a question about uh, coordination on 185th Street with other departments. So we've been coordinating closely with Sound Transit in particular uh, for their, B their bus rapid transit lane. Um, community transit as well, I think is gonna be using this corridor. So we're keeping there needs in mind as we uh, as we permit this project 
Bothell Fire is involved in the review process and of course uh, community development and public works at the city of Bothell. So um, fire uh, should not be impacted. The uh, new fire station 42 down the street is not going to uh, be requiring any additional right of way for their purposes. So, um, and, and as I said, Sound Transit is, is deeply involved with the design here. So I think everyone is being, uh, all the other agencies are being considered. And there was also a question about the historical context. Uh, this is a, a snapshot of the Keeney Edition, which is the subdivision that these parcels were originally created from. And you can see uh, down here, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor or not, but on the center line of a 185th Street, which evidently used to be called Pine Street, um, the property line was trended north all the way from 104th Ave up toward Ross Road. So it appears that there must have been at some point uh, some right-of-way dedication on those eastern, or sorry, western three parcels. And so the sliver that's left is, is what the applicant is looking to uh, vacate today. I did speak to our historic preservation consultant, Sarah, Desimo, Sarah Desimone, and she reviewed this project during the demolition permit phase and under uh, Title 22 and found that there was no impact to any of the any properties of historical significance. Um, this, uh, this subdivision was originally platted by Mark E. and Ann Keeney in 1955 for development purposes. So based on the available information, staff is recommending adoption of an ordinance granting the proposed street vacation. Um, and uh, with that, I'm open to any questions. Council member McAuliffe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So as I'm looking through some of the um, review of the immediate vicinity, I'm interested in how this uh, project will capitalize on the um, Main Street and the historic charm there. It kind of says that um, this development and other developments will actually create a pedestrian friendly downtown area. Can you speak to that at all? Uh, yes, I can. Uh, community, our community development department is reviewing the uh, uh, open space requirements. And I know that there are quite a few open space elements that are being proposed for this project. Also, it is following our downtown standards, which are which is uh, part of our uh, comprehensive plan. And we're making sure that those standards are being met. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Zorns. Peter, first, I have to thank you for being so diligent and comprehensive and, and tracking our concerns and questions. It's very much appreciated and I'm sure sometimes fatiguing, but it, it really is appreciated. So I have a few things that I just wanna ask slash verify. One is I have driven around and walked that area before and I was trying to figure out where the where the trees were landing. There's I noticed there's some poplars. Those are, you know, not going to survive even in the best of conditions, but there are a couple of evergreens and it's pretty significant, you know, large evergreens. As far as you know that they're not going to be affected by this, whether it whether we um vacate or not with the plans that they've got going on? I think if I could answer that, I apologize for interrupting. Um, the, the purpose here is for the sole question of whether or not to vacate the 127 square feet that right. is currently public right of way. Um, I believe the question is whether or not there are any trees within that 127 right. feet. Okay. Right. Thank you. Mr. Pearson, do you have the answer to that question? 
Uh, there may be. I, I do not know for certain if there are. Um, I know that uh, part of the permitting process involves a tree retention plan that must be approved again by the Community Development Department. Uh, and so any large trees would have to be counted and a certain percentage of those would have to be um, maintained depend on, depending on the uh, zoning of the property. I, unfortunately, I don't know for sure if there are, if any of those are in the vacated area or the area proposed to be vacated. All right. Um, I, was, I was trying to figure out if some of those trees, you know, fell, fell, you know, part in the vacated area and part of, part of their current parcel that they have right now. So um, I was hoping we had a little clearer picture on what was going on with them. Uh, we don't gain more units. We just, the unit dimensions just are modified with being squared up. Is that right? That I'm gonna let the uh, developer's representative answer definitively, I, but that is my understanding. Okay, that, that's what my memory was saying when we had this conversation before. Um, and then, uh, how many properties were involved with the two thirds property owners being all right with the abutting properties? How many property owners or, or property? I don't know, you know, you don't have to count the heads in the household, but of the properties, I guess, how many properties were surveyed that abutted to get that two thirds? So there are two properties abutting it. Um, and, uh, and those properties are now owned by Harbor Homes. So the same owner owns both of those properties as well as the three properties to the West. And so uh, they were able to sign off as basically hundred percent of the properties abutting the area to be vacated. Okay. All right. So nobody outside of the property owners weighed in on this. Then. Well, we sent the public notice to all the properties within a radius of 300 feet from the edge of the property lines. Okay. But and no one was, oh, sorry. Uh, no, 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 you're fine. I'm, I interrupted you. No, no one else was required to sign off on the petition. Okay. Did Only you, the property owners abutting the. Okay. Did the you land. get any feedback from the people that you noticed? Yes, and that's what some of those, uh, what, what I received some of those questions from that I was responding to. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then uh, the sidewalk that they're going, because I noticed that the property line shifted with the sidewalk that's being created, does that sidewalk now become city right-of-way? Yes, all that sidewalk would be public right-of-way. Okay, and then my last question is, um, cyclists who are commuting may not may choose not to travel 185th, um, but 185th, even with these improvements and changes, if I were ride, riding my bike, would not wanna be there during peak hours. Um, it, does the nine foot sidewalk, it's no longer illegal to ride your bikes on sidewalks, is it? I'm just trying to figure out if there's a safe place for cyclists to to navigate down 185th. And unfortunately, I don't have the answer to that question um, right now. Um, there are the laws don't allow bicycles to be ridden in a business district um, and whether or not this section would qualify as being in a business district is not something I can um, ascertain on the fly. I'd have to look into that and make that legal okay. determination. OK, because I know at some point people are going to want to ask about lanes accommodating cyclists. And, my gut says 185th is not a great candidate for that right now. I think that's all my questions. Thank you again, Peter, for your comprehensiveness and getting some of the back history on who the Keenies were. I, I really do appreciate it. You're welcome. And, and I can respond to the bicycle lane question uh, a little bit. And that's just to say that the proposed bike route is really along uh, Beardsley Boulevard. And so there are bike lanes being proposed for the improvements along that section of the city. Uh, and, I, and I believe that that is where we're going to be encouraging bicyclists to travel. 185th will not have bicycle lanes and that's per our um, uh, downtown plan. Okay. 
So that would not be the probably the, the uh, ideal place to to bicycle. Beardsley will be the best place. Beardsley into Main Street. Right. Okay. Perfect. All right. Thank you, Councilmember Dewar. Thank you, Mayor. I was going to make a motion, but I think we have to have public comment before I can do that. So I just wanted to say, I think this is a total win. It's in the downtown. It's adding pedestrian infrastructure exactly where pedestrian infrastructure should be. It's adding housing where housing should be um, next to a transit corridor. I, um, I, I mean, it's four feet. And um, to me, it just makes complete sense. I don't know why we would say no, but I guess I'll wait for um, public comment before I make a motion. Thanks. Council Member Agnew. Uh, yeah, during your uh, presentation, you said that it may look like this. You haven't got the exact numbers down yet or the or exactly how much land here and there. How close is it going to be to what you showed us tonight? So the vacation area is is exactly as it is shown. That's from okay. the that's from the exhibits provided by the surveyor that that came in with the petition. So that that land would be exactly as it's shown. The it's the improvements. So the so the turn lane length is is the primary variable that we're trying to dial in uh, with with Sound Transit, um, and then also some of the other. Uh, you know that bulb out area how are, how exactly is that curb line gonna gonna line up there uh those are the questions that are still uh somewhat outstanding um, but that's that's the general layout of of what we are going to improve what essentially what we approved in the site plan review but now we're dialing in in the actual construction permit review okay thank you peter all right, City Clerk, do we have public comment on this? Thank you, Mayor Olson. We received two written uh, comments earlier today. Uh, all, all written comments, I forgot to say earlier, have been forwarded to City Council and will be made part of the record. Uh, the first one we got on this issue is from Melissa Pike, and she wrote in opposition. Um, and also we received one from Harry Ferguson, who also wrote in opposition of this vacation. Uh, Mr. Boyce, if you would like to speak to this item um, or anybody else in the in the attendee room would like to speak to this item, please use the raise the hand function and I will panel you in so you have three minutes to speak. I did not have anybody else signed up to speak live, Mayor Olson. I believe the developer, uh, the representative of the developer, Tyler Churchill is here. Um, I, and since he is technically the petitioner, um, and it's the council's decision to vacate based on the petitioner's request, uh, it would probably be appropriate to give Mr. Churchill three minutes to address the council as well. Okay, um, I will do that. He's already in the room. So I will ask Mr. Churchill if you will unmute your mic and we'll give you three minutes to speak. And then if anybody else in the attendee room wishes to speak, um, I still don't see any other raised hands, but we'll go from there. So Mr. Churchill, you have three minutes. Hello, everyone. Uh, nice to meet you all over Zoom here. Um, yeah, I don't have, I guess, much to say. Uh, Pierre did a great job of explaining um, what we're looking at and the impacts and um, how it's going to affect our design as well as the city right away. And um, yeah, I guess I'm here just to help answer any questions as well. Great. Thank you. Um... Mr. Boyce is good, would like to speak, so I'm going to allow him in and we'll make him a panelist. Give me just a minute. Okay, Mr. Boyce, please unmute your mic and you have three minutes which to speak. Mr. Boyce, could you unmute your mic, please?
There you go. Thank you. You have three minutes to speak. Mr. Boyce. I'm sorry, Mr. Boyce, I don't show that you're muted. Um, can you hear me okay? You should be able to go. I just lost him, I don't know. I don't know what happened. I, he, not there anymore, so. Uh, that's all I show that raise their hand. If he comes back in, I'll see if I can get him back in the room. That's all I have. All right. Thank you. Councilmember Dewar. Uh, I move the recommended action. Councilmember McAuliffe. Second. All right. Thank you. So we have a motion by Councilmember Dewar uh, to... Uh, Approve an ordinance granting a street vacation to Harbor Homes LLC for a portion of the northwest corner of Northeast 185th Street and Ross Road with a second by Councilmember McAuliffe. Any discussion? Seeing none, City Clerk. Please say yes or no when I call your name, Deputy Mayor Zorns. No. Councilmember Thompson. Yes. Councilmember McAuliffe? Yes. Councilmember McNeil? Yes. That was a yes? Yes. Thank you. Make sure I get this right. <laughs> um, Mayor Olson? Yes. Councilmember Doerr? Yes. Councilmember Agnew? Yes. Passes six. One with uh, Deputy Mayor Zorn's voting no. I'm sorry, did I get that Are, wrong? Did I hear you wrong? No, you're right. I would just like to speak to my vote. Okay, thank you. Deputy Mayor Zorn's. Uh, th this was a tough. This was a tough call for me because I, I I know that there's been a lot of thought that's gone into this project. A lot of. Um, uh, time waited on this project, um, but I feel that I owe it to the community that sits around this project that to tell them that I, I've been aware of what's been happening here in the city, that part of why I'm sitting on the council is because of, of the, the dynamics of how the city has been changing. And um, I would just hope um, I wish all the best in this project, but I would just hope that future developments as they come into Bothell just engage the their neighbors in the conversation of we're we're coming in, we're making our legal changes here and improvements on this piece of property. Um, we would like you to be part of the conversation and help you understand what's going on here. And that's all I wanted to say. All right, on to our next item, AB 21-035, a public hearing in consideration of extending the interim ordinance, uh, temporarily suspending development application and permit timelines. So I believe we'll uh, go to Community Development Director, Michael Cotterman. Mayor Olson, could you open this public hearing first, please? I would love to. So I will now open this public hearing and turn it over to Community Development Director Michael Cotterman. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening. Uh, good evening, Deputy Mayor, members of the Council. So this is an item that has been before you a couple of times before. Uh, the City Council originally passed an interim ordinance on an emergency basis back in April of 2020 due to the COVID pandemic. And at the time, we were concerned about a lot of uh, projects that might get stalled in their development process, either in the processing of the applications or in the construction of the projects themselves. And uh, we brought up an ordinance to the council that you passed at that time that suspends the uh, expiration of any permits that are issued by the city. 
as well as the application response times that are required by our code so that we didn't have any projects that were uh, basically getting canceled out or or dying as a result of uh, of covid and the uh, the delays that might occur as a result of that in in our process that was for a six month period the council held a required public hearing uh, the six months was up in uh, September. We asked the council to renew that and you did at that time. We're now s another six months out from the September date and uh, we're asking the council uh, to renew this again. It applies to any applications that were uh, valid and active as of January 1st of 2020. So it has that retroactive clause to it and it just keeps them all alive for uh, for another six months or until the council decides that we no longer need this, uh, this interim action. You can rescind this ordinance, repeal this ordinance at any time by a simple motion and vote of the council, uh, or we can wait another six months and see if it's still needed at that time. So we, uh, it has been used by some. I know we've had several inquiries about whether it was going to be renewed uh, this time. And we did tell those folks that we are bringing it back to the council for your consideration. The only difference this, uh, with this renewal is that because it's been now a year uh, and it's already been renewed once, uh, the state law requires that there be a proposed um, a work plan so that it doesn't just continue on forever. And that is included in the discussion section of, uh, of the packet on page 104. Uh, basically, the city will continue to monitor the public health crisis that we're currently experiencing. And we will assess whether or not this continues, this needs to continue beyond the six months or if it needs to uh, be brought back to the council to be ended sometime before that. Uh, I will say that this is, uh, it's not only a benefit to applicants, but also to the city staff because we're not having to process a lot of uh, extension requests or permit uh, renewal requests. Uh, I will also add, however, that when this does end at some point, I suspect we may have a, a little bit more work to do at that time. And we're already contemplating just how we'll handle all of that. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. And uh, as I mentioned, this is for another six month period uh, would be effective immediately. And uh, this is a public hearing. So if you have any questions before that, and our recommendation is to approve the ordinance extending the current provisions of the, uh, the interim ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Council Member Dewar. I'm gonna go out on a limb and move the recommended action. I would note this is a public hearing. I don't know if we have anyone who wishes to speak? Yep. Uh, so, City Clerk, you're on mute. Sorry about that. We do not have anybody signed up who wished to speak, and nor did we have any written comments. All right. All right. Seeing no questions, Council Member Dewar, one more time. Move the recommended action. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Zorns. Second. All right, so we have a motion by Council Member Dewar to approve an ordinance extending the interim ordinance number 2326 to continue temporary suspension of development application and permit timelines with a second by Deputy Mayor Zorns. Any discussion on the item? Seeing none. City Clerk. Please say yes or no when I call your name. Deputy Mayor Zorns? Yes. Councilmember Thompson? Yes. Councilmember McAuliffe? Yes. Councilmember McNeil? Yes. Mayor Olson? Yes. Councilmember Doerr? Yes. Mayor, uh, Councilmember Agnew? Yes. Pass the 7 0. All right, thank you. All right, so on to our third public hearing. So we have AB 21-036, a public hearing for proposed amendments to the BMC Title 20 Building and Construction Code. I will now open this public hearing and I will turn it over to Community Development Director, Michael Cotterman. Thank you again, Mayor. Good evening, Deputy Mayor, members of the council. 
So I'm just going to introduce Dave Swayze, the building official, who's going to walk you through a very brief amendment that is a correction to the building code amendments that the council adopted back in um, January. I believe it was January. Thank you. Dave? Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor, uh, Deputy Mayor, and uh, City Council members. Uh, thank you for your time tonight. Uh, as uh, CD Director Carterman explained, uh, there was an inadvertent error uh, when we um, made proposal on, on January 19th uh, for BMC 20.04.050, which addresses elevator sizing uh, for stretchers. Um, so uh, the current section of the BMC references the language from the 2015 International Building Code. Uh, the intent was to have the language from the 2018 International Building Code, which was adopted on February 1st of this year. And the, the change in language would, would, would be to remove uh, a, a section in 20.04.050 that explains that residential and institutional occupancy buildings, regardless of number of stories, have to have have to have elevators sized for uh, stretchers. Um, that would be the only change with this. Uh, the language uh, that is the all the other language uh, is reflects the 2018 International Building Code, and uh, that is our whole goal here, um, with one exception that the uh, size increase that we uh, proposed in January from 24 by 84 to 26 by 86 would remain part of this also. Uh, and the, and uh, built and myself and the bill and the fire marshal uh, recommend approving this. Thank you. Any questions before we See if there's any public comment. All right, seeing none, city clerk, was there any public comment? We did not have any uh, written or um, request to speak a public comment on this item. All right, thank you. Council Member Dewar. I just wanted to re reiterate the importance of having consistency with your codes and with that uh, move the recommended action. Councilmember Agnew. I second that. All right, thank you. So I have a, a motion by Councilmember Dewar to approve the proposed ordinance amending BMC 20.04.050 with a second by Councilmember Agnew. Any discussion on the item? Seeing none, City Clerk. Please say yes or no when I call your name. Uh, Deputy Mayor Zorns. Yes. Councilmember Thompson. Yes. Councilmember McAuliffe? Yes. Councilmember McNeil? Yes. Mayor Olson? Yes. Councilmember Doerr? Yes. Councilmember Agnew? Yes. Passes 7 0. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Director Cotterman. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's take a break. Let's take a six minute break and come back at 7.55.
All right, we're back. On to AB 21-037, consideration of a resolution expressing support for state transportation funding, including adoption of a new transportation revenue package. So we will go to uh, interim city manager and our assistant city manager, uh, Aaron Leonhart, and our assistant city manager, Kelly Mazzoli. Evening, Mayor and Council. I'm back for a second round as promised. Um, so as the mayor just introduced the item uh, before you tonight, it is to consider a resolution to support, uh, express support for state transportation funding, including adoption of a new transportation revenue package. Um, as you heard in my report earlier during your legislative update, Bothell has a number of legislative priorities that are most likely only to be funded um, if a new transportation revenue package is um, adopted by the, the state legislature this session. So this resolution attempts to uh, accomplish three things. So first, it urges the state to honor its past transportation funding commitments, specifically the $600 million um, approved in 2019 for improvements to the north end of I-405. Second, it encourages the legislature to include Bothell's current priority, uh, that $7 million uh, Bothell uh, Way Northeast, Bothell Everett Highway widening project. And finally, it reminds the legislature that investments in infrastructure are investments in our economy and support local job creation. Um, I also, um, while, while the resolution actually doesn't specifically uh, ask for a certain package to be passed, there are several right now that are under consideration. And so I was just going to pull up briefly for you. Let me share this. Can you see um, my screen share? Yes. Excellent. So this is a PDF overview of the five uh, currently proposed packages for uh, transportation um, uh, funding. And the Washington Ports actually put this together, but it's just a, a really good sort of side-by-side -side comparison. And as you can see, there are also, um, it talks about the duration and so, sort of gives you just a snapshot here and also uh, looks at some of the different types of revenues that they're proposing to use. So this link was provided to you in your week nine uh, legislative update. So it makes it really easy to get to, um, but you can also access it on Washington Ports uh, website directly in their blog. It, I think it's maybe the uh, one of their latest or second latest um, blog posts. So pretty easy to see there on their website. Um, let me see, stop sharing here. Um, so staff's recommended action, as you know, um, uh, we're asking you to approve this resolution to urge and express support for the state to take this action on transportation revenue um, as it directly relates to our priorities. And those priorities are, um, you know, they're, they're integral to having a complete um, uh, transit system that comes into and a hub for our transit agencies here in Bothell. Um, so the staff's recommended action is to approve the resolution uh, expressing support for state transportation funding, including the adoption of a new transportation revenue package. So like I said, transportation a number of times. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, there we go. Council Member Dewar. Uh, I wanted to ask the city attorney if I should abstain since you're lobbying the uh, legislature. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Just wondering if I should abstain. Um, I, I can't say yes or no whether or not you should. If you, um, there would not be a problem if you were to abstain. Um, I'll just abstain for clarity. Okay. That's good. Yeah. Thanks. Council Member Agnew. Well, then I was just going to say that we approve the resolution expressing support for state transportation funding, including the adoption of a new transportation revenue package. Council Member McAuliffe. Second. All right. 
Thank you. So we have a motion by council member Agnew with a second by council member McAuliffe. Any discussion on the item? Seeing none, city clerk. Please say yes or no when I call your name. Deputy Mayor Zorns. Yes. Council member Thompson. Yes. Council member McAuliffe. Yes. Council member McNeil. Yes. Mayor Olson. Yes. Council member Dorr. I'll abstain. abstain. Council member Agnew. Yes. Pass the 601 with council member Dorr abstaining. All right, thank you. And thank you, uh, Kelly, for that presentation and uh, so quick. All right, on to AB 21-038, consideration of plan and code amendments to the capital facilities element in Imagine Bothell, the comprehens comprehensive plan and establishing minimum density and intensity within North Creek, Northeast 195th Street Activity Center. And I saw uh, Director Cotterman come on here, so I will turn it over to him. Uh, thank you, Mayor Olson. Good evening, and good evening, Deputy Mayor and members of the Council. Uh, I feel like a bad penny this evening. You just can't seem to get rid of me. But fortunately, I think this is the last item I have on the agenda tonight. Uh, and I'm going to introduce Nathan Lamb, our uh, new senior planner, whom you've met previously. Nathan's going to pick up where uh, <clears throat> Bruce Blackburn left off with this about 15 months ago when the council was initially prepared to adopt the 2019 amendments. So uh, Nathan is going to walk you through what those are, what's changed since that time, uh, and explain the, so the thinking behind that. Uh, as I mentioned, this is something that you have seen before. So uh, with that, um, and I, I will note that there is no public hearing on this item. Uh, this, there was a public hearing held previously, so we're not needing to hold a public hearing this evening. So with that, Nathan, I will turn it over to you, and I think you have a brief presentation to share with the council. Thank you, I do, uh, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, and uh, Council. Good to see you again. I'm gonna attempt to share my screen. No presentation. And you should all be able to see that, correct? Yes. Okay, good. So um, we are circling back around to uh, comp plan and code amendments uh, that were omitted as part of the 2019 uh, annual uh, comprehensive amendments uh, cycle. So as you're well aware, each year you've got an opportunity in the last quarter of the year to bundle amendments and um, uh, uh, pass them each year. These were two items that were uh, omitted. The first one is um, amendments to the capital facilities element of the comprehensive plan. And the second item is um, has to do with the amendments to the residential activity center zones in uh, the North Creek sub area uh, and both of these items were halted due to uh, the SEPA appeal by the uh, Canyon Park uh, Business Association uh, that was back in December of 2019. Uh, I do want to um, clarify that uh, we're only going to be, for in terms of the second item, uh, RAC zones, we're only, we're only talking about the North Creek sub area. This, that won't have anything to do with Canyon Park because when you adopted the Canyon Park uh, sub area plan, it sort of uh, voided uh, amendments that were similar and, and coupled to what we'll talk about tonight. So uh, as um, Mike mentioned, the public hearing was closed after being continued uh, several times uh, in February of last year. And uh, as I understand it, you all had made a, adopted some, some language to Title 11 that enables you to visit, uh, revisit these items as long as you considered uh, these as part of the annual amendment cycle, you can um, come back to them in subsequent years. And so you're well within your authority to do so. Uh, so just to talk a little bit more specifically about the items, uh, the, the first one, uh, the, the language and the, the policy language in the capital facilities element needs to be updated to reflect uh, uh, the fire stations 42 in downtown Bothell and, and 45 in Canyon Park, the, the rebuild. 
of both of those. Uh, and then the second item uh, will be um, discussing minimum densities and intensities in the North Creek uh, Activity Center. Uh, so for the fire station rebuilds, uh, you may recall back in November 2018, uh, there were some voter approved bonds for safety upgrades, uh, technical modernization and uh, some energy efficiency upgrades. Uh, for both of those stations. And this is already included and reflected in your 21-22 budget. So we're not proposing any or asking you to consider uh, anything to do with the budget. Um, but it, this is important uh, this month because as of April 1, uh, we will be increasing uh, fire impact fees. And so we need to um, make sure our language is consistent uh, with, with imposing those new fees. Uh, so moving on to um, the minimum densities and intensities, I, as I understand it, you guys have um, discussed FAR at, at great length and um, back in the early 2000s, the, the city established uh, activity centers and residential activity center zones in which the basic ideas that you're trying to accommodate the, you know, the, our share of uh, population growth and concentrate it in centers. Um, what was happening was there was a down. So the whole, the the catch though was is that we there was no prescribed density, and so what was happening was is developments were coming in and they were coming in below the threshold of of that range that we are trying to stick within um, in terms of accommodating growth for for housing units and, and jobs and activity centers. And obviously, if you've got the capacity for more density, you don't want to undershoot that number because you have to make up for it somewhere else. So uh, what we're proposing is uh, 35 dwelling units per acre um, uh, uh, for residential buildings, for uh, non-residential buildings, uh, a minimum floor area ratio of 0.50. Uh, and then where there are mixed use buildings, um, where we are either asking you to consider, <clears throat> excuse me, where both of these options are tied together. So they could, they could either go for a FAR of one, or they could meet one of the thresholds um, and make up for the balance or fill in the balance option we're calling it. So if they meet 35 dwelling units per acre in the residential portion of the development, then staff can use its discretion to uh, work with the applicant uh, on the remainder of the non-residential uh, portion and vice versa. Uh, and then finally, before we get to our uh, recommend recommendation for tonight, so uh, you all should have received an email. Um, there's some minor just clerical errors that are in the ordinance that we wanted to go over there, um, just sort of Typos. Uh, the first one was an example in the ordinance for how to calculate FAR. Uh, there's just one number we're changing from 4,000 to 5,000. The example is if you have a 10,000 square foot lot and a minimum FAR of 0.5, then the building area must be 5,000 square feet. Uh, the second one is uh, related to an outdated map. Um, and we would like to nix that, just take it out entirely and probably update it and bring it back later this year uh, as part of some housekeeping amendments. Uh, but it's we just would like to remove it to avoid confusion. Uh, and the last item was just some language that was related to that, um, to that figure. So uh, all of that can basically be summed up in this, um, the, under, the underline here, whoops. Uh, which is to adopt the ordinance with the amendments uh, recommended by staff. And I can be on standby if you have any questions. Thanks. Councilmember Dewar. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. I'm a little bit confused. Uh, one, why it's 2019 comp plan and code amendments because we're in 2021. So I don't know if I'm in a time warp. 
Um, and then <laughs> the other question is, um, I thought we were only allowed to do a comp plan update once per year. And we're looking at making some amendments later. So I'm wondering why we're adopting it now. So just procedural questions, really. I'll try to take a stab at that and um, defer to Michael if I miss anything. But I, I did, I apologize. I skipped over uh, why, why this was halted. So as part of the Canyon Park SEPA appeal, uh, we weren't able to move forward with these amendments. Uh, and it's the appeal has since been withdrawn. Um, and so since that happened, we are um, in tandem with the language that I mentioned uh, earlier in Title 11 that allows council to come back and revisit um, items that it considered on a previous planning docket. Uh, you are you are able to approve them now. Okay, that clears it up. Thank you very much. Yep, sure. Just, just to elaborate, that does not preclude us from doing any amendments this year. They're not counted against our amendment cycle for this year. This is just specific to these, the SEPA appeal. Correct. Okay. We had, we had a, a number of discussions. Um, we kind of played with it. I'm a Star Trek fan. I called it the temporal prime directive. Gives everybody a headache when you start talking about it. But under SEPA, you are allowed to, because these were considered in 2019 and discussed in 2019, even though we're not adopting them in 2019, we can do these and then also 2021 considerations. Perfect, thank you. Deputy Mayor Zorns. Uh, just a couple of quick clarifying questions. First of all, Nathan, thank you. Glad for your first official report here. Um, and very well done. Uh, uh, it's not germane to passing this. It's more. It's more of a point of curiosity. If someone was to to use the far transference, do they save? Is it a cost saving in construction as far as foundation costs for someone who's you know going for height and a smaller base? Yeah. Um, if. Let me just make sure I understand the question. So you're referring to the option where um, if they can't, if they, where they want to do a mixed use building and they need to meet one threshold or the other and they're. I think so. I thought, I thought the point of FAR was to give people options on, on the shape of their building as long as they met, met the requirements. Right. Um, Gave them right uh, options. Yeah, so as I understand it, so that before, um, so without these minimum requirements, uh, the building envelope size would have just been left up to what's in the underlying zoning. Um, and what was happening was we weren't meeting um, those densities and intensities uh, that we really need to be able to accommodate growth. So in setting a minimum FAR, we're, we're making sure we're meeting our growth management uh, goals. And um, I don't know, I'll have to defer to Mike whether or not there's uh, on the cost. Say, I'm, I'm not sure I follow the okay. Okay. part of your question. That was more a point, a point of curiosity. Um, but mm -hmm. the but one upside to this, if I'm understanding correctly, is that we can end up with more open space. Is that it, correct? The FAR approach gives gives more flexibility to the, the design of the site, <clears throat> excuse me, the use of the site. So from that standpoint, uh, that's a possibility. It's not, it's not a requirement necessarily. It's not directly related to the FAR. Okay, all right. And then the other question I have is for these areas that we're applying FAR to, uh, do any of those abut areas where there's a different, different land use, single family residence, or are they or is it uh, buffered? Go ahead, Nathan. Uh, I'll, I'll yeah, I'll take a stab at it. I, I'm probably uh, with <laughs> having minimal experience with the North Creek area. I would, and, but just from looking at the zoning map, I'm sure that there are because I know that the entire sub area is in all RAC zones. Um, and so I'm, I'm sure there is, but I'll let Mike um, elaborate. 
<laughs> and I was just going to add that, uh, you know, we'll go back and take a closer look at that. But on the in the case of uh, other places where we have the RAC zone or those different zones, different intensity zones, then we have, in most cases, we've built in buffers or additional setbacks of some kind. So I suspect that's also the case here, but we'll go back and look at that again. Okay. All right, so so if if somebody was going to utilize uh, um, the FAR zoning, they would have to meet that 40, is it 45 degree? I believe. The closer they get to somebody, another yeah. property. Property. I, I believe that's the case. And and keep in mind what we're imposing here is does not increase what they're allowed to do now. Right, right. It doesn't change that. It's really just making sure that we set a floor so that they develop at least at that level. So any provisions that are in place to, to address those adjacency issues are not affected. They would still be in place. Right. I, I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, there's a difference between two stories and four stories depending on where it's sitting on on the parcel. Yes. Who's who it's impacting. That's why I'm asking the question and I may be asking it wrong, but but thank you for your patience. No, I the, the question is 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 right on. My point is that those those provisions, those protections would already be in place. Perfect. You guys are great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Council Member Dewar. I move the recommended action. Council Member Thompson. I'll second. All right, so we have. Excuse me, Mayor. Could I ask for a clarification? Does that include the uh, amendments as proposed by staff? Yes, it does. Thank you. So we have a motion by Council Member Dewar to adopt the ordinance with amendments recommended by staff, with a second by Council Member Thompson. And for clarification, Council Member Thompson was your second with the recommended amendments by staff? Of course. Just <laughs> <laughs> Any discussion on the item? Council Member Thompson? Thank you, Mayor. Um, no, I just wanted to say thank you for bringing this forward. I mean, North Creek is one of those areas that's going to be close to a transit line. Um, it's close to the school. Like, this is an area where we need more density, more housing. It's the greenest thing to do. It's the best thing we can do for housing affordability. It hits on a lot of our council goals to do this. So just thank you for bringing this. I appreciate it. All right, seeing no further discussion, city clerk. Thank you. Please say yes or no when I call your name. Uh, Deputy Mayor Zorns? Yes. Council Member Thompson? Yes. Council Member McAuliffe? Yes. Council Member McNeil? Yes. Count Ma Mayor Olson, sorry. Yes. Council Member Doerr? Yes. Council Member Agnew? Yes. Passes seven zero. Thank you. Thank you. All right, on to AB 21-039, consideration of approval of a pop-up retail incubator program. Uh, so I will start off with interim city manager, Aaron Leonhart, and economic development manager, Jeannie Ash. So I will just introduce uh, Economic Development Manager Jeannie Ash to do a presentation for you. Good evening, Council. Um, it's a pleasure to see you all and thank you for your time. Um, I want to share my screen with you. And so if I can confirm that you can see my uh, slide presentation? Yes, I can. Thank you, I appreciate that. So um, once again, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council. It's a pleasure to be here. For the record, my name is Jeannie Ash and I'm the Economic Development Manager for the City of Bothell. And I am here to present to you a uh, program for uh, Bothell's pop-up retail incubators. And this evening, I'll be asking for your support and input on this program, as well as um, authorizing the interim um, city manager uh, uh, to sign the associated documents for this. So we have an opportunity here in um, the city of Bothell to create equitable and diverse businesses 
generate more foot traffic for the downtown sub area, boost the sales for the area's existing businesses and generate more tourism, as well as create a pipeline of new resilient retail businesses through a pop-up retail program. Um, what is a pop-up retail program? Well, this particular program, it has two major elements. One is the infrastructure side of it, and the other side is the program side of it. So what you're seeing here in this image is, a, um, is an example of what a pop-up retail might look like. This particular, these particular sheds are in uh, Michigan or Wisconsin. Oh, someone correct me if they know the answer. Um, so the infrastructure side is uh, prefab sheds converted into usable retail space. We'll buy four sheds, cluster them together, and create a critical mass of interest in foot traffic. They'll also to generate revenue for the city. This particular shed that you're seeing here is what you might find, is a typical of what you might find in a shopping mall. So the program side of the retail incubator is, um, is an incubator it, to remove barriers to starting a business. I think you all know how difficult it is to start a business. And uh, what we want to do is uh, support small businesses by providing them the infrastructure and providing them access to microfinancing and, um, and mentorship. I think you know that, I mean, two of the major roadblocks to starting a business is the financing as well as the educational component. This particular uh, uh, group of sheds that you're looking at here are in a small town in Pennsylvania. Uh, this community actually had a commercial lot that they tried to sell for 10 years. When they couldn't sell it, they cleaned it up and put these retail sheds on it. And um, this is the result. So the um, participants who we are targeting, who we want to be a part of this program, will be home-based retail businesses with a plan to extend, expand. I don't know if you realize it, but we have almost 300 licensed home-based businesses in the city of Bothell. And I'm sure we can find some uh, participants who want to go brick and mortar in there. Or we want to find uh, a first-time retail business owner with a great idea. This incubator program will provide an opportunity for people to learn about the market, improve their business skills, and generate sales. I also too want to say that this program will be inclusive and diverse. We'll be, um, we'll be looking for participants um, who are women or um, minorities. So in exchange for the infrastructure and for the programming, uh, tenants will agree to enter into a concession agreement with the city of Bothell and in lieu of rent, they will pay 10% of their gross revenue. They agree to create a placemaking environment around their shop. And what that means is I want them to have some skin in the game. I want them to keep their shops looking uh, attractive and the placemaking could be either uh, plants or benches. Um, they must commit to regular business hours create and maintain a marketing plan and have an exit strategy. So um, incubators have a really bad reputation for being nothing more than uh, some place for businesses to have cheap rent. So by having an exit strategy, what we're doing is we're, we're preparing these businesses to go out and launch them into bricks and mortar. My hope is, is that we can run this program for a minimum of two years for this first group of businesses. So this cannot be done um, alone. This is a very, very collaborative effort. And my partners in this project are the Port of Seattle, who will uh, provide an economic development grant to secure the services of Mercy Corps Northwest and, and pay for the infrastructure in part. City of Botha, of course, is a project manager, uh, property owner, and we'll be supporting this project with permitting and inspections. Mercy Corps Northwest will be provide technical support um, mentorship and access to microfinancing. And this construction association to be determined is, um, I am looking for volunteers. I've been having conversations in the community and working on getting commitments to find people who help me do the site planning as well as put these sheds together. They are prefab, but they might need some construction. And I need assistance and know-how on 
site planning and hooking them up to electricity and basically getting them to pass muster for our building official and fire marshal. So um, our fabulous Begin at Bothell marketing, tourism marketing plan will help us with the marketing. Um, we will also have our own um, communication strategy. And then um, working on an ad hoc citizen advisory committee who will help us define the type of retail, uh, review the applications, um, support the installation, and hopefully come up with a better name than Bothell Retail Incubator Program. So um, let me see. That's the um, that's the end of my presentation. Um, you know, in the partnership with Mercy Corps Northwest, um, I worked really hard in finding a a partner who can provide services and microfinancing. And I have to tell you that I'm super super um, excited that Mercy Corps Northwest agreed to enter into an, a, a partnership with us. And Lynn Rankin, who is the, um, the uh, executive director for Mercy Corps North, Northwest is on the line. And Lynn, there, there she is. I would like to for her to introduce herself and tell you more about her program and who's gonna be working with our local businesses. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks, Jeannie. Thanks for um, having me here tonight. Um, my name is Lynn Rankin. I'm the executive director of Mercy Corps Northwest. We are a nonprofit organization based in Portland. Um, at Mercy Corps Northwest, we support small businesses with financing and education and support. Um, we support under-resourced communities. We've been operating in Oregon and Washington for 20 plus years, we have a 25 person staff um, with people based in Portland, the Seattle area, and also in Walla Walla. And just a little bit about um, Mercy Corps Northwest. I know it's late, um, but but basically we operate a, a three legged stool. We, we provide a small business education and one on one counseling to entrepreneurs, to small business owners um, on issues around legal, brand and marketing. Um, we have classes and then we also have counseling or we refer people to different classes. Um, we have a matched savings grants program um, and then we're an alternative lender. We, we provide loans of $500 to $50,000. We have a, a line of credit from the SBA that we, we on lend and assume the risk for. And then we also have another, uh, we also have another fund for ITIN holders uh, under $5,000. And then during COVID, we worked with cities like the city of Bothell um, and counties to, to disperse uh, 4.6 million in total in emergency grants to support hard hit small businesses to help keep them open um, and, and to pivot their businesses. We did this in, in the Puget Sound area. We did it in Portland. We've done it in Vancouver, Clark County, the Walla Walla and the Tri-Cities. We also are working with our um, client base right now to defer loan payments and then provide loans um, uh, to those who need them. Uh, about 90% of, 92% of clients who walk through our doors return for additional services and 96% of the businesses we support are in business 18 months later. Um, we tend to skew uh, that most of our clients are female, about 65%. 80% um, of our clients identify as underserved or um, BIPOC members. And the majority of our clients live at or slightly below the federal poverty line and below 80% of medium family income. So that's a little bit about um, Mercy Corps uh, Northwest. We are looking forward to working with um, Jeannie in the city of Bothell on implementing what I see as a, a really innovative vision that Jeannie has for pop-up re retail downtown. We've got um, two members of our team that would work closely with um, this project with um, Jeannie. And, and really I see our roles is, is helping to identify the right entrepreneurs, um, finding those people, and then connecting them to the services that they need um, so that they can be set up for success. So I will stop there. Yeah, 
So again, um, I'm super excited to have a partner like Mercy Corps who um, is going to help us identify the right clients and help them be successful. Um, this is all about, this is this has so many uh, positives, I think. It's a way for us to activate, continue to activate the downtown sub area to create new businesses, but also to, to help it, um, come out of recovery, COVID recovery, and help our businesses be more resilient. Because these, these businesses located at City Hall will create foot traffic for the rest of our businesses. So with that, I will end and I am happy to answer any questions. Deputy Mayor Zorns. I think we're all, well, it's unfair to speak for everybody, but I think we're all a little giddy with the anticipation on this because there's so much potential in this. Um, and it's so well thought out. I really thank you for um, the presentation. <coughs> quick, quick question. Um, could uh, Mercy Corps or someone else give us uh, recommendations on sheds that will provide enough security so when <coughs> excuse me they're closed they're closed for the day it, they're hard to break into so, so um i will be working with a local i'm looking to find a local contractor or an engineer or somebody to help me make these type of um uh decisions deputy mayor because um and if you have any other recommendations i will take them readily the next part Part of this is um, identifying how we set up the infrastructure because candidly I haven't I don't know well if you're already asking those questions you're already a step ahead of me so thank you okay. councilmember Thompson thank you mayor um, Jeannie there's nothing about this that I don't love like this is so cool. This is an uh, underutilized property helping underserved entrepreneurs and help making our downtown more vibrant. Um, my, my only question is when can we do more of it? <laughs> my, um, I just want to say that my hope is that we can, um, we have our first round of entrepreneurs and we can support them for two years and then launch them into the, into the bricks and mortar world and um and hopefully we can do more then fantastic thank you so much council member agnew well I, i'm just gonna say the same thing everybody else said i, I think it's a wonderful idea and i think thank we you. need support as, and you have my total support council member mcauliffe thank you mr mayor i i, I think this is just wonderful Jeannie. i just I'm so excited that you have brought this idea and this plan to Bothell. It uh, is, is kind of goes, and we talked about this today, it goes in partnership with the uh, Bothell Kenmore Chamber of Commerce Cultural Development Committee, which is now forming in order to bring people uh, from diverse backgrounds uh, and women and, um, and cultural differences to businesses, to become businesses in Bothell, to grow. And so I know you're working closely with Andrea Schaefer, who is the head of that, and I'm trying to attend their meetings as well, but they're just up and coming. So this really is a great partnership for them as well. I have one, just one question, and that is, how, because, of, because knowing about applying for um, app applications for the farmer's market, my one big question is, um, where are the restrooms located? So, um, and you're, that's a great question. And that's another, I think they'll probably, it, it's probably going to be dependent upon where on city hall property, we decide to put these sheds. There's about um, two, I think, good viable spots and a third option that is not the best option. I need to um, review it with public works de department to understand the timing of cleanups and and just you know and making sure that the site is ADA accessible, and once we know that, but yes, um, uh, porta potties have been considered. <laughs> Thank you, and I know that and garbage and all of those issues that you're always asked to identify when you 
uh, do permitting or applications for permits. So I know you're on it. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate it. Council, Council Member Dewar. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Jeannie. Um, I don't need to add to your praise, but I, I will. <laughs> I love it. Uh, the question is, why four? Um, why not eight? Um, it seems like you would want. <clears throat> I mean, I'm just picturing myself going down there and getting to the fourth booth and going, what? I want is, more. So it's a matter of finances. Um, it, it's, it boils down to that. I have a, I've actually been thinking about this for more than a year. And um, the direction I received was, that's a great idea, you have no budget. <laughs> so, <laughs> and we're operating so lean. So I have a very small economic development budget of $50,000 and we're getting a grant. And so, and, uh, so right now we're starting with four and Mercy Corps contract is for four. And if we do more, the contract will need to increase and my, my um, infrastructure budget will need to increase. So yes, I, uh, that's, that's bottom line. It's just a matter of finances. I wish I had a better answer for you. It always comes down to that. So there's no way we could use LTAC dollars or anything like that or. You know, that's a really yeah. nice question. I appreciate that, but I don't know the answer. Um, I could certainly find out. Um, one of the things that I want to, um, um, before we get too far down the path of, of planning for more, which I think is a lovely idea and I would love to do it, I would want to have a conversation with Public Works. Our property on um, City Hall property, it's L-shaped, it's sloped. Um, part of it is still contaminated. So we're kind of limited where we can put these. We can definitely get creative. There's no question. And, um, but I, I, would pref I would like to uh, consult with Public Works before we headed down the path of securing more. Yeah, I just, um, it's such a great idea. And it obviously you seem to have the full support of council. So whatever we can do, to help support the effort and make it as successful as possible. I think you would find some willing partners. That would be great. And and thank you for that. And I will definitely take um, a closer look at that and see if we can add more um, and beef up the, uh, uh, the <coughs> budget a little bit. Um, I do want to say that right now we're scheduled to Mercy Corps contract, assuming that this is approved. <laughs> Their contract begins April 1st. They'll start working April 1st. And what the goal of having a very short first season starting in August. Um, and then um, I'll be working with the ad hoc committee on determining what type of season we'll have. Do they quit in November and have a little short, you know, holiday season, those kind of decisions. But next year definitely will be a longer season for these. And we'll see, we'll see how it goes. We're learning. Awesome. I, well, I was going to make a motion, but I, I think I'm going to second Tom's because I saw his hand go up. <laughs> I don't want to scoop him. <clears throat> well, I just want to say thank you, Jeannie, for this uh, great presentation. I really like the the opportunity our community has to kind of have a role in, in growing these and hopefully, mm -hmm. you know, following them through their journey and then find them where they're, you know, find a permanent home in, in Bothell and then look back and say, like, I remember back when they were, you know, just a little baby business. And um, so I, I think that's, that'd be great if we can see that progression and uh, get multi-generations of businesses mm -hmm. grown in Bothell. So uh great great activity here uh look forward to it uh i saw council member agnew's card and then i saw council member thompson's already so uh, council I, member I think we should uh, start building the next starbucks here in bothell but i think we first have to move the recommended action thank you tom uh council member thompson uh, I will. Um, I will second that, and I'm not supposed to say anything else here, am I? Not yet. Okay. All right. So we have a motion by Council Member Agnew. Uh, let's see. Two, two. 
uh, to approve the pop-up retail incubator program and authorize the interim city manager to sign the Port of Seattle Economic Development Partnership Grant in the amount of $29,730 and the Mercy Corps Northwest PSA in the amount of $15,000 with a second by Council Member Thompson. Any discussion? Council Member Thompson. One thing that I forgot to mention earlier is we were all sad when Country Village went away. And something like this gives us something back that is like what we had there. And it won't ever be the same, but um, I, I am really excited for, for that piece as well. All right, seeing no further discussion, City Clerk. You're on mute. Sorry. Uh, please say yes or no when I call your name. Uh, Deputy Mayor Zorns? Yes. Councilmember Thompson? Yes. Councilmember McAuliffe? Yes. Councilmember McNeil? Yes. Mayor Olson? Yes. Councilmember Doerr? Yes. Councilmember Agnew? Yes. That's a seven zero. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, so we will do this next item and then I'll say we'll do a break before we get in, into the voting. So let's move into AB 21-040, the fourth quarter financial uh, for 2020 financial update. And I believe I saw that we have uh, Director Bothwell. There he is. Thank you. All right, so this is your fourth quarter 2020 financial update. Uh, because the fourth quarter is the final reporting period for 2020 and for the biennium, I'm going to share with you the preliminary results of 2020 and the biennium. I've also got a quick 21-22 forecast update, and then I've got a list of a few things I want to share with you that are going to be coming your way from finance. So during the third quarter report, I mentioned that it appeared that we were um, starting to see a trend of stabilization and possible recovery. Uh, that trend did continue in the fourth quarter and I've got a few highlights for you. Uh, in the fourth quarter, we had historic sales tax collections. So in the month of December, we had our highest sales tax collections ever. Uh, and that was true for the fourth quarter as well, highest collections uh, for a quarter ever. So it's a really positive development. Um, sales tax collections tend to be cyclical. So I would expect to see solid sales tax performance uh, in future periods as well. Another highlight is the CARES Act reimbursement uh, funds were received. That was $2.1 million of unbudgeted inflow of resources, which helps out the general fund cash balance quite a bit. Uh, and otherwise, revenues were unremarkable, which is a positive thing coming out of the turbulent and uh, unpredictable times uh, that 2020 has been. So, uh, and then the expenditure savings continued in the fourth quarter. So all those things that we did to save money uh, as a result of the expected revenue losses resulting from the pandemic. Uh, those savings continued in the fourth quarter, which also helped the bottom line. So uh, the story for 2020 is very similar to the fourth quarter story. Uh, the pandemic related revenue disruptions were relatively short lived. Um, so for most of the year, uh, for six months in the middle of the year, we were experiencing significant revenue disruptions as a result of the pandemic. But then in the fourth quarter, things kind of late third quarter, fourth quarter, things started to turn around uh, and head towards a more normal economic cycle, uh, which we hope will continue. And the CARES Act funding was obviously another big story for 2020 uh, that significantly helped our general fund cash balance. Um, and then the pandemic response resulted in significant expenditure savings. So we saved almost $2 million as a result of the uh, early actions that were taken in response to the expected revenue losses. So the result in 2020 is going to be a surplus. Um, these are preliminary results, so the final report won't be issued until the audit's done in a few months. Um, other funds also performed well. Uh, REIT was okay. Uh, it was trending down through most of the year, but then we had some individually significant transactions in the fourth quarter uh, that helped bring us back to uh, not quite budget, but not as bad as we thought it could be. 
Utilities also fared fairly well despite uh, some slow pays and increasing delinquent accounts. So for the biennium, we had some challenges. Uh, sales tax underperformed relative to the budget by two and a half million dollars. Uh, utility taxes also underperformed by two million dollars. And the general fund uh, revenue forecast for 1920 uh, also had the proceeds of lot A, uh, the sale of lot A in it. Uh, that sale did not close. And so that was another uh, negative $1 million adjustment. But there were highlights in the biennium as well. So there's the CARES Act reimbursement again for $2 million. Um, there's the state's ground emergency medical transport program, uh, which we collected more uh, in transport revenue than we'd expected by about $2 million. We have interfund charges and investment gains and in interest uh, exceeded budgeted amounts by about $2 million. And then we have the pandemic response and other savings, which positively impacted the finances by $2.5 million um, for a total of $8.5 million to the positive. So for the biennium, we had losses of about $5.5 million that I listed as challenges on the previous slide. Uh, those gains were $8.5 million. And the net surplus that we're expecting to realize for the biennium is approximately $3 million. So this is really great news based on the fact that there was a global pandemic that occurred during this biennium. Um, so for us to have maintained the financial stability of the organization through that uh, and to come out with a surplus is really a positive. Um, but there are some of the measures that were taken to shore up the financial condition of the city early in the pandemic. Uh, those are scheduled to sunset in the 21-22 biennium. So as we go back, get back to full staff and full strength as an organization, uh, there will be more pressure put on the general fund again. And so uh, we need to continue to be vigilant. So I'm going to switch gears and talk about how this report impacts the 21-22 forecast or the current budget that we're in now. Uh, the Q4 results or the fourth quarter results increase confidence in the 21-22 forecast. Uh, a lot of the predictions that we made when we were developing the revenue forecast uh, are actually coming true. The assumptions we use are also pretty consistent with what's actually going on. Um, and so we have a lot of confidence in the forecast. And I don't expect huge adjustments. Um, the disruptions. Uh, were dealt with in the forecast for the 21-22 budget. And by disruptions, I mean the things that showed up on that slide that I listed as challenges, uh, the underperforming sales tax and utility taxes, and then the way that we're accounting for property sales. Um, we knew those things were coming when we were doing the forecast, when we were drafting the forecast for the 21-22 budget. And so those are already accounted for there. So um, there shouldn't be too much concern about a, a second adjustment needing to be made during the mid-buy for that. Um, and then in the first quarter of 2021, we've already seen some pretty significant, uh, individually significant transactions that are helping out our REIT collections considerably. Um, so it's really likely at this point that in 2021, we're going to uh, exceed the budgeted amounts for REIT, which is always a positive. I wanted to give you just a, a list of a few things that are going to be coming out of the finance department uh, in the next few months. I just wanted to give you a heads up about them. Uh, we're working on a new uh, financial dashboard that we intend to publish monthly. Uh, again, that should be coming out in the next few weeks. Um, we've also got a business license fee simplification project. And this is something that I presented to you back in February of 2020. Uh, and I let you know that we were going to go talk to the business community about these simplification efforts. And we had to put that on the shelf during the pandemic. So we are picking that back up. Um, that project is aimed at getting us on the state's business licensing system. And so you'll be hearing more about that soon. We also have to issue another $10 million in bonds for the fire station project. And then near the end of the year, we'll be talking about the mid biennial budget adjustment. So that's the end of the presentation. As always, I'm happy to take any questions. Council Member McAuliffe. Thank you. And um, I, I just want you to know I appreciate having a, a kind of a monthly update um, on the dashboard. Is that what you are talking about? Is yes, that that's you're... exactly right. Yeah. And then um, I know that you talked about REIT and hoping that REIT would uh, continue to be strong for 2021. But I did notice that we took out $500,000 from the general fund because REIT didn't perform well enough. Is that going to be ongoing or do you have a kind of outlook for REIT to really increase and hold its own for the lease for City Hall? 
Yeah. Great question. Um, just for clarity, the we did have to take $500,000 out of uh, fund balance to make the 2020 City Hall lease payment. Uh, fortunately, we had enough fund balance in REIT 1 that we didn't have to take it from the general fund. Um, so that's a positive. We do have in the 21-22 budget, we have uh, $500,000 budgeted to go from the general fund because we thought that the REIT 1 fund balance would be depleted at the end of this year. Uh, to go pay for a piece of the gen, uh, the city hall uh, lease payment. And based on, so I think during the mid buy, this will be something we'll be talking about because based on collections of um, that are from these individually significant property transactions, it looks like we won't need that uh, $500,000 from the general fund in 2021. And we'll see how things are looking in 2022. Um, but it is going to be a continuing concern as we the lease payment is frequently higher than we get in REIT 1 collections, which is the only source that we can really use to make that lease payment. Um, so it it's something you're likely to continue to hear about. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Zorns. Thank you, Chris. Uh, great presentation gives us hope and there's light at the end of the tunnel. So, but, but thank you for the sobering word of caution to, we can't, that we can't let our guard down. So that, that, that is uh, helpful for a lot of us. Uh, just a quick question about utility payments. Are, have those, have the defaults uh, and delinquent ones, have they, have they stabilized or, or are we seeing a slow increase, slow decrease? What, what, what's happening with utility payments? So it's a great question. I unfortunately am not super close to um, that, the people that are doing the utility billing. And, and what I can tell you is that the financial condition of the utilities uh, during 2020 wasn't significantly compromised as a result of late payments and delinquent accounts. So I, I think there's a, there's a problem there. I know that late payments and delinquencies have increased significantly, um, but I can't, I, unfortunately, I can't quantify that for you. I can reach out to, to some of the utilities folks and get some information and we can distribute that to you by email if you like. Um, I, yeah, whenever you have, there's an opportunity to just let us know, email's great. Um, we don't need to make a big presentation, but we ought to be cognizant of it. So thank you. I'll make a note. Thank you. Councilmember Thompson. Thank you for the presentation, Director Bothwell. And I just want to say that, like, considering where the conversation was, you know, six, eight, nine months ago, um, this is refreshing. So, and we still have a structural deficit. We still have all these things that we have that are challenges. Um, but is anybody else thinking like, can we find $50,000 more for Genie to put more pop-up buildings after this? Anyway. I, I kind of felt like that would come back to me since I was <laughs> presenting right after. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I will say that that we're going to be looking, you know, there's a, a lot of money coming out of the, with the the most recent, uh, the name escapes me, but the most recent relief bill that's going to be, there's going to be some money coming our way and stuff. And I think we will try to get creative. I mean, there's a lot of budget was the one that Jeannie brought up, but there's a lot of other considerations. So uh, I'll do my best to make sure that she gets the resources she needs to support that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Director Bothwell. Uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, for what we went through, this was great news. Uh, we definitely acted early and decisively. So we definitely made some painful decisions, but I think they paid off. So we're, we weren't in a crisis situation now and we have, you know, some room or flexibility once we go into our biennium biennium discussion um but yeah as, as you mentioned since we did do uh so many actions uh and measures that do have uh some that they will be sunsetting that we will have to look at this and 
as other mentioned, uh, we do have our structural deficit and continue to have to be mindful of it. But, but I, I think overall, this was great news that, um, uh, that we weathered, you know, the storm and hopefully it's, it's continuing to blow past us and we can hopefully get back on a, a, a great trajectory here. So thank you. Thank you all. All right. Well, I, we have our board and commission voting next, but let's take a, a five minute break before we get into that. Uh, so let's be back at uh, 9.02.
All right, we are back, and we are on to AB 21-041, Consideration of Board and Commission Appointments. So, City Clerk. Thank you, Mayor Olson. Now we come to the fun part of the evening. Um, I will say before I begin, um, because we enabled the chat function this evening. Um, when we initially did that, we thought that we could enable the chat function just for this particular item, which was my intent. However, we found out we could not do that. So the person earlier in the evening, when they were chatting um, and, and sending all those messages, those are, go are going to be made part of the record. So I just wanted to send that out and let everybody understand that. Going forward, chat's going to be disabled just as it has been in the past and we only enable we only have it enabled because of the voting tonight so with that um i'm going to ask that um we start we obviously we had interviews last tuesday on march 9th for board and commissions and you all have a matrix in front of you and i'm going to ask that you respond to me only in the chat and there's a little drop down there that you can respond to just me with your votes and we'll go round one and we're going to go into the closed session uh, for labor negotiations while we tally if we need round two which i'm anticipating we might then we'll have council conversations take place while we tally two round two and then uh we'll go as many rounds as we need to so is that, is everybody, does anybody have any questions on this? All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna call you one at a time and I'm gonna ask that you, if we're for arts commissions, first one, for instance, I'm gonna ask that you type in three names, your three votes for the three positions that we have. So if you could, again, just respond to me only and we'll go from there. So and council member Agnew, I'm sorry, Madam Clerk, just to clarify, when we click the chat function, um, there is a little thing that says two with a colon. Currently mine says all panelists with a an arrow downward. If you click the downward arrow, there's an option of selecting Laura Hathaway City Clerk and then pop, popping up in parentheses in red, it says direct message. Is that the method you prefer that council members communicate to you? Yes. <laughs> That's the correct answer. With, Thank you. with confidence. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. So, uh, first, I'm going to call on, I'm just going to call on uh, alphabetically, actually. So, Council Member Agnew, would you please send me your chat message for uh, the Arts Commission? Done. All right. Okay, hold on. I'm uh, Council Member McNeil. I'm gonna I'm gonna call on everybody individually. But since I you apologize, said, I was trying to clean it okay. up, and it didn't. I'm work gonna, so we'll take you out of order because you already sent your vote. So that's good. That's fine. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. Next is Council Member Door. If you please send your three votes for. Thank you. Okay, Council Member McAuliffe, if you'll type in your three names for Arts Commission. Done. Okay, thank you. Mayor Olson, if you would do the same. There you go. Okay. Uh, Council Member Thompson, if you would please type in your three. All right, now, not last but not least, uh, Deputy Mayor Zorns. You should get it. The blessings of being at the end of the Thank you. All right, so let's see. All 
We got it. We got it. We are. We got. Uh, we have to have a majority vote. So those appointed to um, the Arts Commission are Hillary Hillary Long with seven votes, Mary Beth Turk with five, and Kobe Zeifman with four votes. So we are done with arts. Good job. All right. Good job. Yeah, that was easy. All right. So now we're going to move on to landmark. Preservation Board. I will say, I will say that we do have a person that is currently on Landmark Preservation that um, has applied for Planning Commission. If that person is appointed to planning, then we're going to need to do another vote for Landmark. So maybe we should put this out. How about we take this after we do planning? Take it a little out of order. All right. Next up is library, and we only have one, one opening on the library board. So um, I'm going to again take it in alphabetical order. So Council Member Agnew, we're voting for library board now. Okay. Uh, no, that's all right. Um, okay, next up is Council Member Door. Okay, next up is Council Member McAuliffe. Next up, we have Council Member McNeil. Next, we have Mayor Olson. Next, we have Councilmember Thompson. And last but not least, Deputy Mayor Zorns. And we have an appointee, Erica Olson has been appointed as a new library board member. So, with four votes, sorry, thank you. All right, Lodging Tax Advisory Commission. Uh, we have three openings. We have three applicants. So, um, Councilmember Agnew, <laughs> Councilmember Agnew, please type in your your names for um, LTAC. Uh, to shortcut this, we could also make a motion to accept the three nominees by acclamation. Okay. Someone would have to make such a motion. So moves. Is there a second? Sorry. Second. All those in favor, just raise your hand. And Councilmember McNeil, if you could say aye. If... Aye. Okay, perfect. Thank Great, you. that's perfect. All right, so those appointed to LTAC are Brittany Caldwell, Catherine Lally, and Laura Lilly uh, by 7 0, everyone. Thank you. Okay, next up, we have the Parks and Recreation Board. So, um, Council Member Agnew, please type in your three names for Parks and Rec. We have, I'm sorry, one, one name, one name. I know. <laughs> one name is what I'm looking for, Parks and Rec. Okay. Council Member Doerr. Council Member McAuliffe. Council Member McNeil. Uh, Mayor Olson, Council Member Thompson, and last but not least, Deputy Mayor Zorns. Okay, so we did not get a we did not get a majority vote on any of them. Uh, any of the applicants. So we'll come back for round two on uh, Parks and Rec. Okay, next we have Planning Commission. Quite a few names here, quite a few applicants. We are looking for two, two votes. So I'll start with Council Member Agnew. Ah. 
Okay, Council Member Door. Council Member McAuliffe. Council Member McNeil. Mayor Olson. Um, Council Member Thompson. Okay. Give me one second. And Deputy Mayor Zorns. Okay. So, uh, Kerry Westerbeck has been appointed. He received um, six votes. And the others, uh, we'll have to go round two. So, please, when we go to round two, we'll take Kerry Westerbeck off the list. And um, everybody else is up for grabs. All right. So, now we're going to go to Landmark. And because Mr. Wester Westerbeck has been appointed to planning, you have two people you need to vote for on Landmark. So, um, Council Member Agnew. Are there three? Oh, it's three. I'm sorry. Yeah, three. Sorry. Three people for um, Landmark. Okay, and Council Member Dora, I just got yours, so give me. Okay, Council Member McAuliffe, you're going to vote for three. Council Member McNeil. Council Member McNeil, you've got, uh, you voted for the same person twice. Can you, can you do that again, please? Great. Thank you. Mayor Olson. Council Member Thompson. And Deputy Mayor Zorns. Okay, we have, we are, we are done. Round one for landmark preservation. Ali, Rami Alcabra received five votes. Alex, I'm gonna butcher this last name and I apologize. Babazadinov received seven votes and Larry Reed received seven votes. So thank you. And then we have shorelines and we have actually, we only had one person apply for shorelines board, but we had two, uh, we have two openings. So, um, and I believe one was just came up um, right after we closed the application pro process. So if you could vote for two names on shorelines, that'd be great. Councilmember Agnew. Uh, 
Okay, Deputy Mayor, our Council Member Door. I'm sorry, you're muted. Sorry, I missed. What are what are we doing now? So uh, we're voting on shorelines, and unfortunately, we only had one applicant for the shoreline board, but we have two openings now because one came in right after the the um, advertisement closed. Did we? We didn't ask anybody. If, but did anyone say that they were? I actually, we Andreas Winardi was okay. one that we spoke to. Somebody, but I didn't write it down. And Carolyn Schaefer, she's in parks. Yeah. Right. I don't know if I'm selling it right, but. Okay, Council Member McCullough. Okay, thank you. Um, Councilmember McNeil. Uh, thank you, Mayor Olson. Mm, Councilmember Thompson. I couldn't find who were the people that um, we're interested in Shoreline's board as a secondary. Carolyn Schaefer and I think um, Andreas. He Winardi. is Winardi. Landmark Preservation Board. Yeah, and Carolyn Schaefer is in Parks. Do you want me? Do you want to go to me and then come back to Mason? Please. Okay. <laughs> Okay, um, Council Member Thompson, you're up now. I will say that on on the second um, for Shoreline Board, if if somebody gets appointed, um, I will double check with those people to make sure they actually want to. And if we have to, we can go back out. Okay, so Council Member Thompson, did you vote on your names yet? Finally. There you go. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so, right. Suzanne Burnell has been appointed. She got six votes. And, and Carolyn Schaefer has five. And again, I will double check with Ms. Schaefer to make sure that she's, she's willing and willing to participate. So um, that is done. So I don't know, Mayor Olson, do you want to go back to round two for planning and and parks or do you want to go into the let's let's keep the momentum this is going a lot faster than anyone thought it's anticipated i'm very excited okay no i know i just okay. jinxed it sorry everyone. that's okay um so we'll go planning first again please do not vote for mr westerbeck he received six votes last time so you can take him off your list um, and we'll go now we're going for planning commission. Please vote for one. <laughs> one. <laughs> so I'll start with. Oh, okay. Hold on one second. Okay. Can, hold on one second. I just got a chat. I just got a message from council member door regarding shorelines. So I just want to make sure. Okay, so Council Member Doerr, I'm going to clarify, are yours? Yeah, I'm, I, I wasn't paying Can attention. Send, send I, the two you want, is it, is it Schaefer then? I mean, Schaefer, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so, okay. So Suzanne Burnell got seven votes, okay. Great, thank you for clarifying that. Okay, so now we're back to round two on the Planning Commission. 
Um, and so we're just asking for one vote. So council member Agno, if you could send your, thank you. And uh, then council member Doerr. Uh, Council Member McAuliffe. Thank you. Mayor Olse, uh, Council Member McNeil, I'm sorry. Thank you. Mayor Olson. Council Member Thompson. And Deputy Mayor Zorns. Okay, we'll have to go round three on that one. We did not get a majority vote again. What's that? Oh, yeah, I can tell you, what I can tell you is that uh, Tynan Gable, Gable got two votes. Uh, Claire Robson got three. Stephen St. Louis got one. And Daphne Taylor got one. So, Mayor Olson, do you want to go round three on on the Planning Commission, and and or do you want to two round two on Parks? Uh, let's do Planning Commission. Okay, so we're gonna go. Uh, oops, Council Member McNeil is raising his hand. Yes, I'm um, sorry, Laura. Can you clarify those numbers again one more time? Yeah, I'm sorry. Sure. Um, so. Tynan, Tynan Gamble got two votes. Claire Robson got three. Stephen St. Louis got one. Daphne Taylor got one. Thank you. Thank you. All right, are we ready to go round three on planning? Okay, okay, so Councilmember Agnew, you've gone. And Councilmember Dorr, can you? Okay, Councilmember McAuliffe. Thank you. Councilmember McNeil. Mayor Olson, Council Member Thompson, Deputy Mayor Zorns. Okay, uh, nobody got majority, but what I can tell you is that Tynan G Gable got three votes. Claire Robson got three votes and Stephen St. Louis got one vote. So we'll have to go fourth round on that. Do you want to do you want to do that now? Yeah, we're so close. Okay. <laughs> okay. So again, those, those favor, favor. Can you give it can you give us just a second to digest? Yep. Okay. Like start the yep. clock. One minute or something. Okay. Again, uh Tyne and Gable got three votes. Claire Robson got three and Stephen St. Louis got one. So if we can do round four, that'd be great. Uh, council member, hold on, uh, Agnew, wait, council member Agnew, did you just vote just now? Yes. Okay. Um, all right, and council member Doerr. And next up, I have Council Member McAuliffe. Then we have Council Member McNeil. Mayor Olson. Council Member Thompson. And Deputy Mayor Zorns. Okay. So is that right? Okay, uh, so that Claire Robson has been appointed to the Planning Commission with four votes. 
in four rounds. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so now we are on to the Parks and Recreation Board round two. So I will tell you, so we do not need to vote for, right, so take Caroline Schaefer off your list because she has been appointed to Shoreline. And you have Trish Villanova. Excuse me one second. The four votes. Oops. Yeah. Okay. So please, okay. So this is what we got last time. And I'm gonna, so again, take Carolyn Schaefer off the list because we have just appointed her to uh, shorelines. And again, I will verify that with her. And what we had from last time was Laura Borner got two votes. Laura Scude got one vote. And Trish, Trish Villanova, uh, Villanueva got three votes. And Carolyn got one. Uh, one so but she's off now Does that make sense and are you looking for one vote this time i am looking for one vote yep so council member agnew all right thank you council member door council member mcauliffe Councilmember McNeil. Mayor Olson. Councilmember Thompson. Deputy Mayor Zorns. Great, we got four votes uh, for Laura Borner to the Parks and Recreation Board. So now what I need is a motion. Thank you very much, that was great. Um, now what I need is a motion to ratify those votes. Council Member Dewar. I motion that we ratify those votes. Council Member Thompson. Second. All right, so we have a motion by Council Member Dewar with a second by Council Member Thompson. Any discussion? Seeing none, City Clerk. Great, thank you. Uh, please say yes or no when I call your name. Deputy Mayor Zorns? Yes. Councilmember Thompson? Yes. Councilmember McAuliffe? Yes. Councilmember McNeil? Yes. Mayor Olson? Yes. Councilmember Doerr? Yes. Councilmember Agnew? Yes. Passes 7 0. Thank you very much. Um, I will, we will be reaching out. We will notify all the applicants whether they were appointed or not. And, um, and I will double check on Ms. Schaefer for the Shorelines Board and we are done. That went way faster than I anticipated. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, paper ballots. Whew. Uh, all right. Uh, well, so we have our closed session uh, for our next item uh, regarding labor negotiations pursuant to RCW 42.30.140 parent four, parent A. And let's see, it's approximately expected to be approximately 30 minutes with no action and we will return to this meeting I'm almost thinking if we do council conversations first, then we just adjourn from there since we are done with voting. We just, so we just need to make sure that if the, that this meeting remains active so that if the 30 minutes is insufficient and we need to extend, we have a mechanism to do so. We will do that. Thank you. Excellent point. All right. So, Council conversations, topics. Council Member McAuliffe. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I just wanted to cover a few items that um, of meetings that I attended and some upcoming ones. Um, I did the, I did uh, do the Bothell Kenmore Chamber of Commerce meeting, and I want to recognize the donation to the Senior Center by Chelsea and Courtney at First and Main Design Market. They are doing all of their chairs. They're doing their carpeting. They're redecorating their kitchen at the Senior Center. And so if you get a chance, stop by and say thank you to them. Because I think that they're very excited about what they're doing and they should be done very shortly. And then also um, I want to talk a little bit about, um, let's see. Oh, I want to tell you that on March 25th for the chamber meeting, the guest speaker will be from the lodge at St. Edward State Park. So you get to have information about what the lodge is going to look like, which is pretty exciting. So anybody that wants to tune in, tune into that meeting. And the next really important one is the state of, um, let's see, the state of Bothell, which will be by our own very, uh, Bothell state of the city, Mayor Liam Olson. So he will be presenting at the chamber and that date is April 28th. So put that on your calendar as well. And then um, I think, let's see, did I have one more thing? Oh. Uh, just so that we can get it on the record, North Shore Rotary is um, is going to partner with Kenmore to establish a dog park. And then when I mentioned that Bothell also would like to have a partner, they said they would partner with Bothell as well. So that would be a really good thing for all of us. So that's my report from my chamber meeting. Great. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Zorns, were you looking for your little yellow stick? I'm looking for my notes. <laughs> Are you ready? <laughs> well, I really don't have much except to thank the fire department for the great uh, little uh, annual report that's sitting in our boxes. That was fun to go through and see our former neighbor, who we still consider our neighbor, uh, D'Amico Rogers, as a uh, the, the firefighter of the year. That was fun to see. But, well, I don't have, oh, two, th two quick things. One is very sad. I, I heard today there's going to be no Bothell Friday Farmer's Market this year, which is sad. Um, but then also, for those of us who love airplanes, just for fun, it's not in our city, but we're neighbors, right? And so we're good neighbors, is uh, Kenmore is celebrating 75 years, and they're going to have a big uh, celebration the end of summer. So if you're into airplanes, keep an eye out for that. But I don't really have any other, you know, it's more announcements and conversations. <laughs> Sorry about that. Council member McNeil. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to bring up the best starts for kids uh, levy again. Um, a lot of conversation going around regionally about the the levy, um, and I just want to draw everybody's attention to the the presentation that uh, that I forwarded on, uh, and how important this is right now with youth homelessness and the other things that are happening with our young people across the region. Uh, it's important that we pay attention. Um, there's been a couple amendments. One amendment would be understanding how the funds from the levy are actually spent uh, regionally throughout the county. Um, and Mayor Bernie out of Redmond uh, has put an amendment up um, to ensure that we're doing that by zip code. Uh, another amendment that was brought up by Council Member uh from the first was an amendment for ensuring that we have about $50 million for facilities um, that could actually help with youth um, activity centers, community centers, et cetera. So um, very optimistic. Hopefully we can get support behind that to ensure that we get the, the facilities built for the youth. Um, it would connect the north end um, to the east side cities. I think that's a, a big regional win for us to ensure that we, we form those partnerships and uh, ensure that we have some of those facilities up here on the north end. So I just wanted to bring everybody's attention to it and hopefully uh, we can all get behind it. Council Member McAuliffe. Uh -huh. I am really sorry. I forgot one thing, and I think it's important that some of the restaurants in Bothell are live streaming the Bothell High School football games. So go down, make a reservation, watch the game on live t video, 
at your local restaurants. Yeah, and Bothell had a phenomenal win last uh, weekend, didn't they? It was huge. I, I stopped watching. So I don't know the end score, but I'm sure it wasn't pretty. Councilman, Councilmember McNeil? Yeah, I'd re be remiss if I didn't bring up the fact that lacrosse season has just started. And we have a lot of uh, girls and boy lacrosse players out there. Thank you to the city of Bothell for getting the fields open for us so that we can, we can get those kids out and active. It has been amazing to see the, the spirit um, and see those kids out being active. So uh, hats off to the city of Bothell for, for helping the lacrosse programs get out and be active. All right, looks like everyone wants to head over to our closed session. All right, so I'll, I'll say this uh, again. So we have a closed session regarding labor negotiations pursuant to RCW 42.30.140, parent four, parent A, uh, and we expect it to appro take approximately 30 minutes with no action expected. So we will adjourn from there and we will keep this meeting running in case we need to extend. Thank you. All right, see you over there.
Um, Mayor Olson just announced that the meeting is going to be extended another 10 minutes to 10 12. Thank you.
if I can take off the mask off now. Is that okay with that on? Yeah. We wouldn't want our city manager to see us breaking the rule. Okay. Um, the following. Oh, we were recording. Um, yeah, you're on. On behalf of Mayor Olson, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.